Welcome to the Grappling We Re- See exactly. Grappling Rewind Podcast. Welcome to this week on the Grappling Rewind Podcast. On this week's show, we are going to recap ADXC2. We are also going to preview the IBJJF European Championships for 2024. Talk a little bit about an event we just came across that is Pit Submissions uh, Series, which is a karate combat, a new organization that's come out of karate combat run by the Meow Brothers. We are also talking about a little bit about Enigma 515 Quintet and the 1FC Rotolo versus Langacker 2 matchup. As always on the show, I'm your host, Maine. I'm your co-host. Miranda. How you doing, Miranda? Pretty good. How are you? Doing pretty good. We also have a fight to win matchup we want to talk about for the main event for this week. It's, oh, yeah. it's a big old card. After a couple of weeks of lull, we have a bunch of stuff to talk about this weekend. Um, yep. Lots of stuff coming up, too. Do you have any news in this week? I don't think so, because I was trying to look to see if anything like exciting happened. Uh Gordon did say that he's not taking any more grappling matches until the ADCC. Oh, yeah, which we kind of speculated and have talked about. Like Gordon, again, has had an ongoing issue with a lot of medical stuff, specifically his stomach. And um, we've talked about it at length over years in the show. If you don't know, uh, one of the best guys in the world, probably the best guy in the world, is had on and off issues with his stomach. And so he goes into like periods where he kind of just focuses on that and kind of grapples and trains, but doesn't feel in good performance shape to go take professional matches. And if you're fighting pretty much only the best guys in the world, it makes sense. I would love to see him competing more frequently. And that's kind of one of the things we've always complained about is the lack of frequency we see him. But yeah. usually, you know, we see him a couple of times a year. Um, again, ADCC 2024 is we're less than what, six. We're about seven months away now yeah it's august it's not that long i would love to see him more but honestly i would much rather see the best version of gordon at adcc for the super fight if he's potentially is going to do yeah. his div- a division like his last time and the super fight like i want to see the best version of that guy because i think it's wild that he can do that because yeah. no one in the history oh. of the sport has ever done that they also announced that the open that is going to be directly before it is going to be at t-mobile Oh, yeah, they got approval to ADCC, yeah. the World Open, um, the one I judged last time in, in yeah. the World Championships. It's the week before, though. No, it's the day before. Oh, it's, it's the, the day before. It's the Thursday before. Oh, I think I got the dates wrong then. No, okay. I think it's the Thursday before is the event. Okay, then, that makes sense I then. think I could be completely wrong with it, too, because I was like, hey, I get to do it again. I get to yeah. do it at T-Mobile. So that's really cool. Um, that is the basically the open. And ADCC runs more and more opens now, so they're running a World Open again. Before I think, the world championships. Yeah, I think they're what they're doing is the adults are going to be on Thursday, and then the kids because they're doing the whole championship. Yeah, the kids, kids championship. And Mo's been really, really excited yeah. about that. And if you look at the level that's coming out of the yeah. the youth division to ADCC, it kind of makes sense. Again, showcase the younger guys. I guarantee you, we have a couple. In I'm thinking about it now, and I haven't really thought about it until you just mentioned it. Yeah. This is the first youth championships they're running for ADCC. It is. We are is. absolutely going to have a youth, like a 12 or 13-year-old that wins one of these divisions that in 10 years goes and wins a world ADCC title, an I'm adult sure. title. I'm sure. So I think it's really funny that this would be like the beginning of like, oh, yeah, yep, he's the, the kid won and he's won every youth title and then went, go on, goes on to win the world championship. And it's going to be that feeder league that we've kind of talked about and always wanted sort of that the IBJJF has, but I don't think they manage it very well. Yeah. Um, I think we it's... have people rising up the ranks. Yeah. ABCC is going to do the same thing, but through the ages, much like other grappling sports like judo and wrestling have a juniors league and a seniors league, like ADCC is sort of going to take that model and do the same thing. So I'm super excited. Yeah. For it, it looks like the 13th or not the 13th, the 16th. Yes. Yeah, so that's the week before. That's no. like two weeks before. No, the event is the 17th, isn't it? Oh, I have. That's you why. I have, have trials. It, yeah, trials is March thir- 30th and 30th, 31st. Yeah. And I, so, yeah, I yeah. have the dates wrong. That's why. Okay, you are correct. Yeah, yeah. Thank the, you for tri- fixing that. Because trials is right over Easter. Right, and that's yeah. why flights are so expensive to Vegas. Um, so that's that's anyway, exciting. I'm yeah. excited about that. Well, I, I think it's fun, especially if you do do the Opens. I like to do the Opens, and the fact that I get to do an Open at T-Mobile is kind of awesome. Yeah, at the at the, at the venue, awesome. and that's part of the part of yeah. why they do it is because I think it's really cool for the competitors that are not at the World Championships yeah. to get an opportunity to compete in the World Championship arena on that week. Yeah, and I think it was it was really awesome last time we saw some. I saw some. I got to judge some great matches yeah. at that World Open, and I love that they're continuing that tradition and showcasing you got to see those a fight on and there. everything. I got to see Marillo pull a knife. I got yeah. to, I was, I was, that happened there. I was standing, I was reffing, judging there. <laughs> it was, uh, it was a wild evening 
Um, and I'm, again, I'm really, really happy they're doing it again. It gets the community involved and it gets yeah. the competitors in the competitor spirit coming out well, to Vegas and, you, and then you watch the World Yeah, it gives you another reason to be there. You yeah. know, not like you need another reason, but it makes me feel a little bit better yeah. about going there and like sitting and watching matches for two and days. cutting a bunch of weight and then you get to eat whatever you want the day well, after. I don't, know, I don't know if I'm going back down to 55 kilograms. That's... I don't think that, you can make that, it. That's a rough one. I don't, I don't know think if you're I, making it this year. I don't year. know if I can make it this year. So. I kind of need something horrible to have in my life, but then maybe I can make it. <laughs> I'm not laughing at that, but I'm laughing at like, I remember having miserable you were making we weight, and I was like, you're not having a good time, and you're no, like, get me out of this bathtub. I was, I was like, like, okay. fuck you all. <laughs> okay, uh, so then we go on to ADXC. The, yeah, let's do it. Was, let's do the uh, recap. This weekend, or Friday. Friday. It's Friday during the middle of the afternoon. Thankfully, there was a snowstorm hitting the United States, so I did not have to work, so I watched this live. It was great. I had to work anyway, but, uh, yeah. and then you text me like, you sh- it's pretty good. You should watch yeah. it. And, then- and it was, it was five bucks. Like, which is a really, re- again, that's, that is my sweet spot for a grappling pay per view. Oh, yeah. Five it's bucks. Like five I'll- bucks. Like, I'll throw five bucks. And if, like, this had a couple technical issues here and there, not many from yeah. if we're used to grappling. Yeah. Very, like, very, very professional. It was, looking it was run r- very well. Yeah. But- five bucks is, absolutely worth to watch oh, this. five bucks is one of those numbers that they say them like oh whatever five bucks yeah. you know and like i don't even think about it when you start going into like 15 maybe i 15 think to about 20 it. it's like i get annoyed eh. a little bit but then like 30 i'm like uh-uh because like we're, we're going to talk about later uh there's a local guy named muhammad ali not the muhammad ali but the, the world championship 80s nikki right you know you know grappling muhammad yeah. ali if you listen to this grappling show muhammad ali. muhammad ali it's spelled he's a little fighting. differently yeah he's fighting tonight but he's the, making his ma debut yeah but the which allegedly took a million years to get to. I think Lloyd said eighty different matchups fell through. Something that's like probably that. a little hyperbole, but like yeah. Lloyd said that it he is. He definitely these... had a lot of matches fall through because I remember some of the oh, local yeah. promotions trying to find matches for him and no one for did. like a year. Yeah, like I think Shogun and other and like one other Shogun and um, Stellar Stellar did. tried to find fights for him for I think I heard about it. I, Almost two years ago. I saw it announced a bunch of times. And yeah. No one wanted to touch it with the 10 foot pole. Mm-hmm. And then uh, finally, he's down in Houston, Texas. But he hasn't fought yet, to my knowledge. I keep on looking just to check because yeah. I'm pretty sure he'll win. I so, mean, yeah, it's positive he'll oddly, win. <laughs> oddly, we're recording this on a Saturday night because yeah. I'm flying out for work tomorrow. And so it's a, it's a rare Saturday night recording for this uh, after the show host got together and did some D&D yeah. before this. I mean, we have no lives. So it's we're... great. We're having a good time. <laughs> so, ADXC. That was great. Five bucks. Um, a little hard to find the link for it. I think it's a... No, nope. a- it's TX7.AE. It yeah, that air remembrance. AE, five bucks. Worth it. So let's start where you like to start with the main event. Aljamain Sterling versus Chase Hooper. Um, I did not think that Aljamain Sterling would come in and be exciting in this match because the last couple of matches yeah. that we've seen Aljamain Sterling in, he has not really looked to be as active. Or like he's... Go back and watch the Fury fight if you're looking for what we're kind of complaining about. Aljamain Sterling turned it around here. He, did. he came in as the notably smaller guy. Like, this match was yeah. at 170 because Chase Hooper and Aljamain Sterling, who were in different weight classes in the UFC, yeah. were like, Sterling was like, I don't want to cut the weight. 170? And, and Chase Hooper was like, sure, oh, man, whatever. 170. Yeah. And they faced off, and Chase Hooper has to be what? Six he's, plus inches he's taller than him? Tall, Eight inches taller? lanky gentleman. Yeah. And... Sterling, to his credit, and Chase Hooper did what he said he was going to do. He pulled guard, and oh, then... Oh, but he didn't really pull guard. He let him get taken... He, he got taken down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did. Or he rolled. He rolled a couple... Um, Like, almost like Imanari. Kind of like yeah. joke Imanari rolls. Yeah, You could yeah. tell that he wasn't really looking to get the Imanari roll, the roll underneath Aljamain Sterling. I think it was Sterling. more... I think it was more of him trying to get contact with Sterling. Yeah, because there was one time that he pulled without contact, and they were like, I don't know, you got to have contact with it. Yeah. Um. So, before we get into this match... Let me talk about the rules for ADXC. So ADXC uses, for their main events and their co-main events, five three-minute rounds. Just the main events. Just the, Sorry, just the main events. Just but they the have events. more than one main yes. event, which yeah, is confusing. Yeah, that's where it gets confusing. Well, they call stuff co-main events and main events, but in our our understanding, usually the the final card, the final match of the evening or fight of the is evening the main event. is the main event. The one before is the co-main. Sometimes you can have a co-co-main. Yeah. In some organizations, but they call the top two matchups main events, and then the bottom two matchups co-main events. So they yes. have two co-main events, two main events. Now, it, one was gi and one was no gi. Yeah, for both. So I kind of get it. They'll do main event gi, do... main event no gi. Yeah. Like it's co-main event. 
Regardless, they have for the main events, <laughs> they have three minute rounds and they have five of them. And then for the co main events, they had three Threes. three minute rounds. So for n- all the other Yeah, for everything else it was, yeah. it was that. I think even even the the early prelim matchups yeah, they were, all were three also threes. the color belt matchups for that. I saw a couple of those yeah. and that was the same thing. Um Iggy, we've talked about it we talked about it at length last time. I don't want to belabor the point. Not a huge fan of the rounds, but I did really think the organization did a great job. And this is one thing that we've talked about for AJP before, like the yeah. UAE JJF and their extension for the other pro events, the AJP. They do a really good job enforcing activity and movement yeah. forward because they have such a shorter time. And I think three minutes for well, me is a little too short. Yeah. But they do a really good job forcing and mandating the athletes, much like ADCC does, to be active, engaging, moving forward. And if there's a stoppage of position, if they're in a mirrored position or they're yeah. in a position where neither is progressing, they just reset the position, well, much and, like MMA. And they also they also have a rule that once the one um, individual pulls, as long as they have contact when they pull, the other party has to go into their guard. The other party cannot back up from them. Yeah, so it's it like standard grappling. It's yeah. MMA-style scoring. But with standard grappling rules yeah, but some, for engagement of the top yeah, player. Yeah, some some super fights they don't care about that. Like there's yeah. Well, I guess more it's more MMA. Like if somebody's on your ass in MMA and you back up for them, they have to stand up. Right. Where it this I guess is your standard yeah. MMA rule. It's that, it's scored yeah. like MMA, but it is enforced like action grappling. Yeah. Kind of a mixture of ADCC and AJP's rules with a shorter time frame. Yeah. And the cage comes in handy because what you see is you don't get out of bounds. Yeah. Which is kind of fun. Which instead of doing what ADCC does and just there are no boundaries. Yeah. Because they're in an elevated cage here, they're, they just can't fall out of the bounds. Yeah. Interesting enough, in the cage here, I don't know if you noticed. So if you ever watch um, fights in a cage or grappling in a cage... There is an interface between where the matted area comes to the fence. Yeah. And historically, fighters figured out like 20 years ago that you can dig your feet in between the interface between them and get leverage there against the cage. Oh. And it's a really common thing fighters done for years. You can turn your feet sideways and you can dig the, oh, the blade yeah, of yeah, your yeah. foot in between the cage and the mat because the fence doesn't come out yeah. all the way. And so you can get leverage there. These guys had uh, what looked to be like the covering. Yeah on the canvas but it was tied down and through and that area was covered so oh. the cage came directly up to the edge of the mat and i've never seen that before oh so it was a little thing that i that i picked up and i forget it might have been the yuta shamada match versus gabriel Souza, yeah because there was a lot of cage, cage wrestling on that yeah. mat on that in that match i watched i think yuta it might have been Sosa, I forget who, try to dig their feet like you do in MMA under, and there's a there's like a red it, attachment yeah, there they couldn't dig his feet under. I don't think it was um I don't think it was Sousa because Sousa didn't really Sousa at times didn't seem like he'd ever worked in a cage before. And I think okay. he even made that comment to them that he had never done any work in a cage. And Yuda at least used the cage. Because Yuda used the it cage to been, escape a few times. It might have been Yuda then. I, for and, some reason, I thought it was the white gi. Yeah, but there could also it could also be one of the other matches. Cause there was another match. I want to say it was Lima and Hibamar. Where Maybe they, that's the where match Where they kept was. on going against the cage yeah. a lot. But it was something I picked up yeah. that was just an interesting little wrinkle. As we as we talk about um, different rule sets, and, and yeah. the ADXC is a new, different rule set for us, kind of similar to ACBJJ, if you remember those cards that have come back now with the multiple rounds or something yeah. like Arena with the multiple rounds. Um, it was just interesting, and one of the wrinkles there was that for cage grappling, which you usually only see in SUG and a couple of others, they had that little area blocked, essentially, yeah. in a way. I've never seen an organization bother to do that anymore. It was just interesting. Um, these are the kind of things that we key in on Grapple yeah. Rewind. It's like little, like, not fights, just like, oh, look at that. Well, the that one gap thing, is done. The one thing I realized with this was that everybody um, had their uh, belt. Yeah, we talked about the last not, time. Their belt not uh, taped. secured or taped. I love that. We talk, Josh and I talked about that when we covered ADXC1. Yeah. I think this is something that all professional super fight organizations that well, have D matchups should do. You don't... I, one of my friends, because I made a comment about it online, and one of my friends said, like, they started doing it at Metamorphs. Because oh, yeah, yeah. He said they started doing it, Because like, Bill Cooper took, took like, five like minutes to sign. To, minute, like, yeah. minutes yeah. to tie his gi. And so, what we're talking about is an ADXC, which you should watch. It was an interesting yeah. card. Um, for the If you have a belt and a gi matchup, because they had gi yeah. and no gi here, grappling and, and jujitsu is what they called them. Jujitsu, yeah. Jujitsu was the... They would take duct tape, like colored duct tape, either, either like red the, or blue duct the tape. The same 
one that they would wrap your your gloves yes. with. Yes, Glove and tape. they would wrap the actual belt loop. Yeah. Um. So the belt wouldn't come untied, and as a result, belts don't come untied. And I think if you're going to have a belted organization where you allow belt grips to yeah. happen, I really liked that the belt can't come off. Yeah. Like I like I. We've talked about it for years. Like, well, do you, you mandate a knot tie or how they have to tie it? And there's all these other workarounds. I kind of like, just like the gloves for the fighters in MMA, you yeah. tape the glove or boxing or any other fight sport, you tape the glove shut. In this, they tape the belt shut. Yeah. I, I really, I really like that because it, we just had, it eliminates an issue that we see frequently where it's like, well, is the belt in the way? Is it getting tied? Can yeah. you use it? Can you not use it? Nope, or where it's they, tied the whole or time. Or where they accidentally untie their belt so they have to retie their belt. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, or do you not have the guy who doesn't have the belt now? So yeah. all these throws, the overhead throws can't be yeah. used anymore or... Is he now taking that time was, between rounds yeah. to do it? It just fixed all of and that. And when we talked, to, when we talk about Lima, he he used a lot of a band, uh, he used a belt grip. A lot. Yeah, that overhand belt grip, a lot of yeah. him are. Um, it was fun. So th- that's the rules for it. <laughs> Again, the rounds. I don't like the rounds, but I think it was done well here. They have enough mandate to push the action and activity where I was okay with the rounds and the athletes. None of the athletes on this card. On the for the matches we're going to cover, at least the ones that we saw, we took notes on, seem to um, try to game it and like be inactive yeah. or inattentive. They yeah. seem to get everyone on the same page. Like, hey, you're going to be on this card. We need you to go and push the action. No, we and expect I you watched to push the, the entire action. card live, and no yeah. one and everybody pushed. So I don't know if that's a so. rule or an app the way they they talk to the athletes, but something about that we got a consistent level of activity. I again, I think longer rounds for pro level people. They we we have criticized SUG before, yeah. which is also a cage event. With five minutes for athletes, which we don't think is long enough, but Sug only has one round. This is multiple three-minute rounds, so you have a yeah. nine-minute match, which I think is a great length of time. I think AJP's six-minute match and ADCC's six-minute match is, is the is the sweet spot for submission grappling. But um, overall, I think it, it worked very yeah. well. For the Sterling versus Hooper match, now back to that match, yeah. um, I was impressed with Sterling, I think, in five rounds. One of the rounds, Sterling is able to fully pass Chase Hooper's guard. Yeah. And then immediately, and they have a top-down camera looking at Sterling here. He slides past the guard with, like, not really a knee cut, with really, like, an outside flop pass over Hooper as Hooper tries to loop his leg back to the closed guard. And then Sterling immediately just gets really high up on the torso and steps over and steps back down. Yeah. It was a really interesting... And way was, to take mount that we don't see a whole lot. No, and I think it was from Hooper going after a, a Kimura. Yeah, like a far side Kimura. It was just really. But it was it was it was good to see also Hooper after having that done maybe twice to him he stopped doing that. Like if you yeah. watched him, he definitely changed the way that he handled mm-hmm. that entire situation. And you saw Sterling happened. get more and more confident in passing and actually. And Sterling in this matchup actually looked like he was looking to pass Chase Hooper. Yep. And so I don't know. That's one of the things we criticized Sterling for his previous matches is like his unwillingness to have the match any place else than yeah. where he wanted. I think he knew Chase Hooper was going to pull. Yeah. And he knew he was going to have to pass the guard. So he went well, in with and, that game plan. And I'm sure he also heard a bunch of shit about his inability to pass after the last match. That's the Fury matchup with yeah. Dantzler. Yeah. I, I was again, I was pleased with Sterling's activity here. No one really got close to submissions at all in this entire match. But No, it was, he had like, Hooper had a... a not a good triangle. He had a almost triangle a couple times. Like a teep, like a high teepee yeah. almost. But he never had Sterling's posture. Yeah, at one point, down. at one point he had almost a go-go plata, and then yeah, and then uh, Sterling like shoved him into the wall, and yeah. I was like go-go plata, and I was like nah. Yeah, Ben plata. Eddie at uh, ADCC the Open in Long Beach at the, at the Walter Pyramid hit a leg in Hindulatine. I don't oh, know if you've nice. seen that. I just saw it like 10 minutes before we started the show. Oh, nice. Um, speaking of Gogo Plata variations. Well, our, our friend Ellis used to hit those all the yep. time. He still does this day. Yep. So this was good. Again, it was not a whole lot of note happened other than really uh, Chase Hooper throwing up kind of the kitchen sink from the guard at Sterling. Sterling really dealing with it well and then actively looking to pass and put forward pressure in. The one pass and then come to mount, I think, is what seals it for him. Yeah. Um, I know they score across the rounds. I think Sterling was doing, he wasn't doing more than Hooper, but I think he was more effective in his positioning yes. than Hooper. It seemed like Hooper was throwing up and not really reactionarily. It's like he, Hooper was pushing the action here. He was. But Sterling was countering better and seemed to be getting the better of the exchanges. And so for ADCC, I think Hooper would take this. Yeah. But in like MMA style grappling at ADXC, the way yeah. they score it or MMA style, 
I think Sterling, I think the decision is correct here yeah. for the rule set. And I um, think um, part of the reason why Sterling did so well in this was because Chase Hooper was throwing the kitchen sink. Yeah, I he think, gave him a lot of opportunities. I think a lot of the times that he failed in the match with Dantzler was because Dantzler wasn't really, he knew he didn't have to do much. Yeah. So he was like, and if you're not having those openings mm -hmm. that of trying to attack the other party, then it doesn't really give Sterling the option Who's, to really do it. Sterling is, a, is an amazing yeah. scrambler. Again, look, go back and watch his early UFC title when he's a really a heavy grappler in his early UFC run, probably like, I want to say 2016 or something like that, right after, I mean, go back go back and watch the Brian Barberino, or not, Bar, um, the... Brian Carraway fight. He doesn't win that fight, but it's an amazing like yeah. grappling clinic in the first round. It shows you forgot, how good Sterling a, is. I forgot about Carraway. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a really fun like grappling matchup, and that's I think that's like 2015 is when I yeah. could be wrong when that fight happened, but um, that was a long time ago because I think he was. Yeah. I think Carraway was still with. Uh, oh yeah, he was a Tate for yeah. even like five, I think and five or six years after. She's already popped out like what two or three babies. Something right now, like something that. Like that. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, it, Hooper Hooper was the reason why this match yeah. was able to to be as interesting as it was. Yeah. But Sterling again, it takes two to tango. Yeah. But yeah. Sterling, I think, takes a pretty pretty clear win here. Um, but I was very happy, and I'll give props to Sterling for actually like coming in and not having the same match we saw him have yeah, at Polaris was, and at Fury. I was scared that the main event of this was going to be yeah. really boring. I, I was happy. Again, <laughs> the, the short rounds, I'm not sure how much that played into it either, but yeah. it worked out well. I'm happy. Let's Anything else on this one? Nope. Let's move on to Bruno Lima versus Manuel Hibamar. This match had one of the biggest shifts of momentum that we have seen in forever. I mean, since not quite uh, Adam Wardzinski versus Felipe Andrew yeah, shifts of momentum, but pretty close. Yeah. Manuel Hibamar comes out in this first round, nearly gets Bruno Lima's back, spends a lot of time pretty dominant over Lima, and then in the next three or four rounds, Bruno Lima ends every single round on Manuel Hibamar's back. Yeah. And it was just such a wild, like, I, I remember seeing this first round, because we, we talked about this in the preview last yeah. week, where, like, how it was going to go between yeah. Lima and Hibamar, um, and we expected it to be, like, I expected it to be Hibamar's favor here. Yeah. And then watching Hibamar come out aggressively, take Lima down um, in the first round and then get his back, and I was like, yeah. okay, this is probably going to be, you know, the short rounds, he probably can't finish Bruno Lima unless he really dives for yeah. something, and Hibamar's not really a guy that we know, at this a guy at the level of Bruno Lima to just jump and take yeah. something. It's just not really his style. I was like, okay, we'll probably see this for four rounds. And then Bruno Lima comes out the next round, encounters like every double leg, yeah. every single leg that Hibamar throws. Throws him on his head. Yeah, off the cage almost yeah. on one. It was like a, it was, Hibamar goes for an outside grip to go and drive Bruno Lima down. Yeah. And Bruno Lima hits an Uchimata over yeah. the top with the counter grip yeah. on Manuel Hibamar on the cross side to hand now. to bring him down yeah. and lands on his shoulder and head. And even the commentators were like, ooh, ooh. that was well, a, they that did was a it. tough I think throw. they did it right in front of the commentators. Oh, like literally directly in front of them. I think they make that comment all yeah. the time. Commentary staff was uh, Hal Teague, um, Brawley Westima, and Vanessa yeah. Demopoulos. And yeah. I think Hal and, and uh, Brawley did a, a great job. Again, yeah. Hal gets a lot, of, a lot of flack from a lot of I folks. Liked, I, I really enjoy hearing him on commentary. I, and I liked Estima because he was he kept on translating what the what the yeah. um, the Portuguese what was being Est said. Brawley was really good about and that. And I was like, yes. He has a, like that old school knowledge yeah. from a lot of guys. And he has he doesn't tend to go into story time as much as a lot of the no, other old school no. Brazilian commentators go, but. Howell with his great knowledge of the current scene and yeah. like the histories of the guys with Braulio's history of the guys too. Like, well, I think they're and besides a great the fact team. that Braulio has a lot of um, he's been there and done that. He has a lot of knowledge too. Yeah. Like he knows all this like really small mm -hmm. like um, kind of more like really complex. nuanced. Like yeah. in the mind of the compete he, he yeah. Braulio does a really great job of like breaking down in the mind of the competitor yeah, and, and like even, how to win the exchange. Yeah, and even in a jujitsu match where it's constantly moving and it's chaotic. Like, he can follow the entire time. Yeah. Which is a hard thing to do. It's a hard job to be able yeah. to speak about it intelligently in, a, in your second language yeah. on a mic. Like Again, that, that combo is, is really, really great. Um, and again, I'm, I really love hearing both those guys together. It's a, it's a great team. I hope ADXC keeps those folks together because they do a great job. Um, they, again, I, I want to have more technical stuff yeah. on this match, but it's really Lima getting the back. It, I well, think three of the five rounds at yeah. the end. And Lima did do camp with New Wave, um, which was very visible. 
because that's where he got he almost tried to or he tried to at one point like mother's milk him at one of the rounds yeah, and like that's, the third or the fourth that round that is like the new like, so every gym has their hallmark yeah and there was the just, new wave guys there really was definitely want to just, guys. yeah there was def- definitely some movements that I felt were very like new wave ish it was almost like you'd see him so the new wave guys tend I'm trying to figure out if you watch enough grappling over the years you figure out and one of, and one of my favorite things to do uh, in, even in MMA is to pick things that specific camps do yeah. and watch their fighters like take on some of these traits. Yeah. Like, so you watch certain camps. Oh, yeah. All the guys throw this cross hook combination in this same kind of way. Yeah. Um, like you watch the Diaz brothers. They both throw the one two and their timing on the, the jab and the cross is odd. They kind of throw them almost at the same time. And it's something that both brothers kind of do. The new wave guys, they they tend to pause in these weird um, intermediaries between positions where most camps will train you to like go to here, yeah. then initiate your pass yeah. and do your thing. The new wave guys will lean on you like half, like 90% through a pass. Yeah. And then they will jump instead of going and finishing the pass and do the next thing. They will jump into like the next control position in their series in a way that a lot of other camps it, they they don't do in the same way, and that was one thing I noticed here with Bruno Lima, is the way that he was controlling Hibamar is that he would, he would the way he would settle Hibamar's shoulders when taking his back was very reminiscent of the way that we see Gordon do it, where he tends to like lean and get heavy yeah. on your shoulders and then open you up from the top to punch the hooks in, and he'll take and he'll punch in the opposite hook first as he rolls you over. And it's the exact way that Gordon does it, and a lot of guys will tend to do it the other way. And it was just one of the things I picked up with again that move to new wave. So well, I don't think he moved. I think he just so not new. The, the camp yeah. at new wave. Yeah. Um, it was it was a fun matchup. I again I was really impressed that Bruno Lima was able to a stuff all the takedowns from Hibmar. I was impressed yeah. with Hibmar honestly for continuing throughout the rounds to aggressively work for yeah. singles and doubles. Yeah. I just didn't. I didn't expect Hibmar to be as aggressive with those, and I didn't expect Bruno Lima to be as um, as present. To consistently yeah. be able to shuck those and shuck him off and throw him or counter him. He even hits a really nice counter, um, not a back drag. Uh, it's, uh, I'm blanking on the judo name for it. I don't know judo names. Yeah, he hits He hits a really <laughs> interesting reversal off of a low single that Hibamar hits, I think in the third or fourth round of the matchup, and then Hibamar's able to scramble up. But like was, a head and arm throw? No, it's a, it's a throw where you're on a low single. Okay. And then it's it's a throw where you lift and turn towards oh. their back, and you tend to knock them onto their butt if they can't tech out their legs. Oh, okay. And he hits the on Hibamar late in the and it was like, it was one of the later rounds. I was yeah. just impressed with him consistently able to get the better of Hibamar in those exchanges from the counter perspective. Whereas most of the time, eventually you have a heavy, you have a heavy pressure wrestler yeah. coming into you, you're gonna make a mistake and not be able to counter at a point in time, but. Lima well, through the last four I rounds it, did it. I think it time. also like having a cage. You know, you know you're running them into the cage. So if you shoot a single or yeah. double, maybe the confidence you know, is there. Yeah, more so. like you don't have to worry about like where are they going to go. Like you're going to run them into the cage, which mm-hmm. I mean gives the party the standing the benefit of not worrying about hitting into things. Yeah, you know. But at the same time, you kind of know where they're going to go. We and we saw interesting enough. You say the cage. A oh, lot of the shots yeah. we saw from Hibmar were open space. They oh, weren't yeah. like into the cage. He used, I think, I think a couple of them, two of them were, but yeah. a lot of them I was surprised. He kind of did what Damian Maya did, which is like, hey man, middle of the, middle of the cage yeah. shots. Um, Lima used the cage to counter, I think, in the earlier rounds, okay. but I was surprised, again, at kind of the lack of use of the cage in some of the takedowns that Hibmar had here. But, but there was a lot of use of the cage in yes. this match. Yeah, Just yeah. not for the takedown sequences. Yeah. But I think it was also Hibmar knows he can shoot because if Lima runs, he's going to run into yeah. the cage. And even though Lima, you know, elected not to do that, Hibmar has the confidence in those sequences to be able to run through the cage. Yeah. Like I'm much more willing to take a guy down if the wall's in play because I know at least I can drive him to the wall and he can't sprawl back on me versus like an open space where it's like he can sprawl to the end of the See, earth. I almost like the open I miss open because I feel like I can run them into things. Oh, I'd much rather cage wrestle. <laughs> I would much rather my 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 takedown game is not great. I would much rather I don't cage like, wrestle I don't people like the wall. than I when would I, when I'm training with people, wrestlers and there's a wall, I try to stay away from the I wall. I love the wall. 
I freaking don't. But then it's I'm so also funny. I'm also wrestling with like 200 pound men. Yeah, so. that'll be <laughs> that'll probably be the reason why I don't like going to the wall. So that was fun. Again, great win for Bruno Lima. Um, yeah. I really impressed he's able to come back from that first round. Uh, moving on to the co-main event, it is a quick one. Uh, Fion Davies versus Luana Panetto. Uh, Fion gets a Renegade choke in 51 seconds. Yes. And it was uh, Luana tries to throw her. And Fion's like, uh-uh, I'm not throwing. I'm just going to jump your back. And she jumps the back. She grabs her rear naked choke. And it was over. And it was uh, quite a fast uh, match all around. And then after it, um, we have uh, Fion... Uh, they go to interview her at the end, and they're like, what do you think of Michelle Nicolini? And she's like, oh, she's awesome. I've always looked forward to her. She's somebody I look up to, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, uh, you're going to go against her? And she's like, nah, nah. You know, and she was, like, all excited about it. But uh, so it's going to be Fionn Davies versus uh, Michelle Nicolini in Brazil at the next uh, ADC, ADXC card, um, which is exciting. It, yeah, it was Sorry, I'm trying to see. I'm trying to figure out right now if we can talk about a match that's coming up oh, for an okay. event. And okay. someone's texted. No one, one of the promoters has texted me, and I'm like, I'm like, well, I want to. Can I talk about it? Because we're doing the podcast right now. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm. I'm really excited to see the Nicolini match versus Fionn Davies. Yeah. It was the drag that got it to the mat. I thought was really interesting because the because Brawley and Howell yeah. didn't even get a chance to finish kind of going through yeah. Fionn and Luana Panero's yeah. like grappling accolades yeah. before. It was really. I thought it almost looked like a shuck by. That Fion hits, where think, it's like, but she get, Luana goes to throw her. Yeah, it's and Fion throw. basically goes under it and yeah. just like sw- and just like swings her down. Yeah, gets the mat, and then Brawley was like, "Oh, I think he's." she's And Brawley was like, "I don't want to jump the gun here, but I don't think she's gonna get yeah. out." <laughs> and you know, like Brawley, Brawley has those eyes at that high level where it's yeah. like he can see things that we watch a lot of grappling that yeah. we cannot see. Brawley was one of, got the, some of the best eyes in the game, and uh, immediately after yeah. the tap happened, but it was just it was a very funny. You could tell the commentary like didn't get a chance to go through yeah. everything they, they had like planned to talk yeah. about because the match was so quick. Um, I'm super super excited about Fion versus Nicolini. Yeah. Like that'll be it's it's again it's a it is the old guard champion yeah. in Michelle Nicolini versus like the but current top of Michelle the game. Michelle Nicolini keeps on competing. She normally I mean she normally doing Master One. I didn't check to see if she's at Euros because I think she lives somewhere in Europe right now. She always does like. Um, camps out that direction because I've always wanted to go to like a jujitsu seminar with her and I've always looked for her and she's never anywhere stateside at all it's always like Sardinia and like all those countries so um but she uh she stays she still stays pretty um she's been to 1FC for a little bit Oh yeah, she and I was, was. I, I was really curious. If, I was really curious if she's going to move into the grappling portion of One FC. But if she's taking a match with ADXC, she may not be with One X One FC anymore because they typically. But wasn't she fighting for them? She was an MA. Yeah. But I would doubt that they would have. Ex- they would not also have exclusive rights for her as a grappler. Oh okay. Um, that would be two separate contracts. Well, and they may not be. I don't know. We, again, we know very little about the One FC contracts, yeah. other than unless you were Gordon Ryan. It is an exclusive contract, much yeah. like MMA. You know, you can't fight for the UFC and Bellator, or PFL. Yeah. One, you know, one FC. You, you, they have exclusive rights to you as a fighter contract. We think, and from what we've heard, they also have exclusive rights to you as a grappler, which is why we don't oh, see okay. Danielle Kelly, which is why we don't see um, Cade and Tommy. But we do yeah. see Tommy Langacker in and out of one FC. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how. But their it might also be. Struggling. It also might be how he has it, or it might be single con- single yeah. fights for him. He I, might have. I don't. It. I don't know because he does a lot. Like he does oh, he's super all active. over the place, and I could see him being like, "Nah, I can't do a contract with you guys." Yeah, but like, usually they say they tell you no because even the Simple Man guys, yeah. uh, Nicky Rod, and um, I don't know. He's he's talked about it's an exclusive contract plus, as well. Like, plus, did you see the video of his foot? No, Langacker. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So let, let's let's. Fiona Davis match is great. Yeah. Go back and go back and look at Tommy, Tommy, Tommy Lanker is going to fight. No, we'll talk about it during the cage. Yeah, we'll talk about that in later. The rematch. <laughs> but moving on, <laughs> moving on to the next match. We get uh, sidetracked. Sometimes. We do get side. It's been, we've had a fun time playing yeah. D and D before him before recording. Um, Pablo Lavaselli versus Espen Matheson, and Pablo has had two. Is it Matheson or Matheson? Because they said it away on the broadcast, and I've butchered it for years Matheson? and years. Matheson? Again, I, I'm going to say it as we do every couple weeks. If you are, if you know how to pronounce his name properly, please shoot us a yeah. DM on Grappling Rewind. Really appreciate it. It's been very helpful over the years yeah. to help us stop butchering it. So, yeah, please 
Um, we always get a lot. We always get a bunch of responses when we ask. So please, if you have a response, please let us know how to pr- yeah. pronounce Espen's last name. Yeah. Um, and Paulo has two wins over Espen. So this is. And Espen has one over Paulo. Yeah. So this is. Or def- Pablo. It's pa- Pablo. It Pablo Lavaselli. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. I'm looking straight at it and I'm like not knowing what to say. But um, Pablo is, was being coached by um, Alves, which I thought was John to Alves. Yeah, well, he was AOJ. So, yeah. And that makes sense. But, uh, yeah, it was interesting to hear his coaching. Then, um, what's it, uh, Estima was translating it all. Yeah. So you knew what he was going on. Again, I, like, I, love what that, going on. I love when they have I appreciate a it. Portuguese awesome. speaker yeah. on the broadcast that also has, like, you know, Estima's a very good English speaker yeah. as well. Um, they, I was, they wa- can translate I was wondering. I was wondering if, like, then you could hear, like, the fighters could heal, hear them commentating. I don't know. But usually, I don't know. Usually, you kind of can a little yeah. bit. Um, I had usually <laughs> use a cage. Side, usually, you can. So because one time, one time, uh, Estima says something in a match, and the guy immediately did it. And I was yeah. like, "Holy shit!" And but I don't know if that was him or like. Wait, I've oh, heard Rogan talk like, about like in. UFC fights where he's been talking about what a guy should be doing and he's and like I don't like, want to like coach yeah. him through it but it's like I have to do the broadcast yeah. and the guy that's doing the thing will get upset because it's like you coached him out of it. it's like I, I had to talk yeah. on the broadcast yeah. so it's fighters can absolutely hear you like, yeah. we've done commentary a bunch and it's like it's a little awkward sometimes when they it's, are a foot in front of you and, and you're like man cool. he's really in deep there yeah. he's really got to fight his hair like you're giving it's super quiet yeah you're, you're giving yeah. advice essentially to one guy or the other because you're trying to explain what's happening yeah. on a broadcast um, this was, I, I enjoyed this match. This is much like their first two matches that we saw. Um, actually, I think I only saw the one match last time, their yeah. World Pro Finals match, where it was 5-4. to four. Uh, this was, I wish, and this is one of the problems I had with ADXC, this is a match I would love to see points for. Yeah. Because there was a lot of back and forth X guard uh, sweeps, really great work from both Pablo yeah. and Espen, but... It was a match that you really didn't think was going to go to sub. Like, both yeah. these guys are... This is an amazing match. Like, these guys should be matched up on every card. Well, and they're going to be matched up. They they could be matched up at Euros. Yeah. Yeah. They could be. But but the problem was, you had three-minute rounds. Usually, where there was one or two sweeps. Usually, yeah. X-guard sweep either way, or like a come-up sweep. Like, Pablo had some really nice pant grip, like yeah. modified X-guard sweeps. Espen had the same thing, had a roll-through sweep yeah. underneath. Like, it was really great activity, but you'd end the round with either a mirrored spot for sweeps yeah. or one person had one but, more sweep but, with no subs. But at least with this match, you did see that um, Espen kind of started slow and got faster with everything. And Pablo yeah. definitely, towards the latter, probably the, the end of the second round yeah. and the th- and the third round was um, slowing down. Mm-hmm. And you could see him not gasping, but like mouth breathing. Yeah. And you, know? you saw Espen kind of realize that yeah. it seemed like and picked and, up the pace up the a pace. little bit. Yeah. I think Espen wins this mostly, and I think you have it in your notes. By here, activity. Activity. Like yeah. he's doing more throughout the match. I think Pablo had very, very good sequences. He had yeah. a couple of really nice sweeps. We didn't see the same thing we saw from Espen that we saw in the World Pro Finals match, which was Espen kind of being willingly going to the bottom. We yeah. saw him forcing Pablo to like fully sweep him up and take him yeah. to the bottom. Um, but again, I wish I would have loved to see points scored for a match like this where it's like you're going to see a lot of mirrored sweeps back and forth. Yeah. It would make more sense from a fan to understand what I'm seeing if it was like scored, like cool, he scored it's six to two or two to two to two or something like that, um, because you're probably not going to get a sub out of these two folks, just yeah. given they both want a mirror X guard sweep back and forth, and they're both better on the bottom, and they're both much better sweepers than passers for this matchup. Yeah. Like it is, it is about so it's neither really, sweeps. so no, neither really care to be swept they care to be swept yeah. but when you're not counting points to be swept right. then it's kind of like who is the fancier sweeper and we both know that they can sweep yeah. each other and that, yeah. that's like the weird thing it's like this is a battle of you're gonna put get put at the bottom you're a good enough x guard or open guard player yeah. to sweep the other guy and the other guy is his main game is probably not is not yeah. even both pablo and espen they're not they're not really they're very good passers don't yeah. don't, don't don't misconstrue what i'm saying here they are much better guard players. Yeah. And so you have two better guard players going to the bottom and then yeah. doing a very nice sequence of grips and then changing to top yeah. position and then, oh, the same thing happens on the bottom. It's like yeah. it was back and forth. Um, but I think Espen wins it on activity. 
it is a match. I play a lot of X Guard. From an X Guard perspective, I had a really fun time watching this yeah. because these two guys play a really active, really um, fun, and like, almost the same as that game. Yeah, it was a very it's nice similar, to see a mirrored game. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if Pablo going to AOJ affects the pacing because especially being coached by John, a guy like Jonathan Alves, who we know typically like John John Alves is amazing. Yeah, and but he tends to work in bursts. Yeah. And it seemed almost like Pablo was looking to implement that same kind of tactical strategy. But he didn't do it. But he wasn't able to like kind of keep Espen on the defensive or, or long if, enough to yeah. do so. Or if he did it, he did it in the first quarter or the right. first. Whatever. The first beginning, but was unable yeah. to keep Espen, you know, and later on rounds, the bottom. He, and yeah, pass he was off unable that. to kind of keep up that pace. Yeah. Like the slow and then faster, faster. It was a really mm-hmm. interesting, like, to look at Alves, who we've seen play the game, but is able to implement every single time. And then Pablo being able to implement in spaces, but not able to just shut down. And I think Jake Watson said it best with John Alves. Like he does, he plays the game and then he takes the ball away and there's no more yeah. game to play. Where it's like Pablo just wasn't able to do that to Espen and it yeah. just didn't work out in his favor in this in this matchup where Espen's able to take the decision over him. But regardless, I'll watch this match every weekend because it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, moving on. Anything else on that? Nope. Moving on to the main card. So we've, we're out of the both co- both main events and both co-main events. Yeah. Um, we had a matchup that we got excited about talking about last week, but it, at least for me, it delivered. Yeah, it was fun. Usually the heavyweights, it's a, especially in Nogi, yeah. it's very hit and miss. Denzel Freeman, who is a very good freestyle and Greco wrestler. I think a, they mentioned freestyle. Um, I think on, we looked him up last week, yeah. he's mostly Greco. And yeah, but then, they. But if you watched him, he actually went for the legs, and yeah. Puglia didn't. Puglia went for the Puglia, legs a ton. Did they? Yeah. Maybe I'm getting I was, confused in my brain. Because so we have a bunch of stuff for both these guys. I was really, I know Denzel Freeman. He's a PFL fighter, as mostly a Greco guy. They mentioned on the broadcast he was freestyle, but I know him for Greco. Okay. Puglia Romani is a is a two time world champion beach wrestler. I think one of those got taken away, but I think he's he's a multiple time world champion beach wrestler he fights out of ac out of um he's an aca fighter as well poya puts on a pace to denzel yeah. freeman and he goes high and low repeatedly and just blasts denzel freeman off at an off angle takedown repeatedly i was really really impressed with romani uh for this entire match like looking for denzel's back getting freeman's back I think at least twice. Yeah, and in, if not three to all three rounds, almost um, just puts a pace on Denzel Freeman. I was, I was impressed at kind of the contrast we saw from Poya in Aiga, yeah. where he played a seemingly a much in his Big Dan match. Yeah. it was really slow. But that's also, but that's also the difference of uh, going against this opponent. Yeah. Because I think this opponent allowed him to kind of wrestle. Where they were both, they both wanted yeah, to wrestle. Where in going against you know somebody who's a grappler that works, that wants to play guard that's three hundred plus pounds and works from a seated guard like that's a different yeah. kind of an animal to play with. I was both of them were willing to wrestle and they were both willing to go and yeah. even even in later rounds after Puyo was kind of putting the pay, like putting it on Denzel he just kept on coming like he kept on yeah trying. very willing to yeah. kind of and again three minute rounds I think both suits these yeah. guys styles and their backgrounds and, with wrestling and they didn't gas well. out like heavyweights normally no do. like there was no gas where like one of them was like <sighs> like half and, dead and the match gets side. boring because they yeah. get tired like I think for the I kind of do like I don't again I've talked a lot of shit for the rounds this entire no episode, but for but for, man for heavyweights, for heavyweights I kind of like yeah. I kind of like the rounds I think more organizations should have rounds for heavyweights like hey everyone if you're under 200 yeah. no rounds you get above 210 yeah, you get at least you get at least two rounds. Yeah, because you get to you get a break, you get a little drink, you get a break, a little get a bit. drink, and you come back I out there. I think there it would bring more. I think it might be more entertaining. Like, I think, <laughs> I've said it for years. UFC heavyweight fight should be three minute rounds. <laughs> you get a, you get a more exciting fight. Yeah. So then we move on to uh, Terrence McKin- McKinney. I have one more point okay, on point I was drinking. Um, I was really impressed with. Usually, when we have we, we saw Poya twice at Aiga in the matches we talked about on the show. Had a much kind of slower pace matchup. Yeah. It is really nice to see a guy be able to modulate what he does. Kind of we talked about an Algerman Sterling's matchup. Yeah. Be able to sort of modulate what they do with a different opponent at that level. Like I did not expect with the matches that we've covered Poya on in the last like yeah. six months, 
him to come out this differently with it, just that stylist to change of opponent, I really liked. This match was a lot of fun to watch where I didn't really know how it was going to turn yeah. out when he previewed it last week. And so I like seeing that level of variability in the athlete being willing and able to change kind of how they approach a matchup for something like this. This was a lot of fun. You usually don't see really good big guy wrestling like this in the no. cage. And this was this was a fun wrestling match, which it is was. something we don't talk about very often in the show. So give credit where credit's due. Like, Romani came out super aggressive and really put on a great performance here over, over Denzel Freeman. Moving on. Yep, moving on. We have Terrence uh, McKinney versus Sydney Outlaw. I actually checked to see if Sydney's Outlaw's name is really Sydney Outlaw, and yes, it is. Yep, it is. I was like, Bellator was has like, pound for pound the guys with the craziest yeah, names. Yeah, I was like, nah, that can't be his real name. Nope, that is his yep. name. Um, but this was, I think, when we originally discussed it, we didn't know how exciting this would be. Yeah, um, we kind of were, we postulated, we were like, ah, it could be good, it could not yeah. be good. But it looked like both of these guys kind of, you know when MMA guys do grappling and they're like, I'm not getting hit in the face, so I don't care. Like, they have yeah. like a certain, like, if you ever talk to an MMA like fighter. Balaze, they, they're yeah. like grappling they tournaments, go, they're just like, now nah, we're fine. Yeah, they're like, fine, we're not getting hit in the face, we're fine, you know, and they don't get nervous about it. Yeah. And it, both of these uh, guys definitely look like they kind of opened up more having a good time, which is always nice to see. Yeah. Um, and Sydney gets a face crank in the, like, in the first round like quick in the first round yeah like, and a little like, over halfway like, to the first it round. looked like a rear naked choke but it looked like he was like ah uh, i go right across your face yep you know and that's very you know really calm we're seeing more and more of that in grappling in the last couple of well, years it also looked like terrence mckinney did not have a mouth guard in like i'm almost positive like he unless he took it i don't think you have after. to i don't think yeah you have he started to. talking to his coach and he definitely was like like playing with his teeth and shit, and I was like, "Did he have a mouth guard in?" Like, because I've been, cr I've, I've had that trials. That's what happened to me. I didn't yeah. have my mouth. Oh, you didn't have your mouth. I forgot, <laughs> no. you forgot. You forgot your mouth. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot my mouth. That. And I got, I got cranked across the face without yeah. a mouth guard, and it sucks. I had. I'm I've, wondering if that's what happened. Not talking about us, but I had a tournament once, and it was me or Rachel. We can talk about us. Me or my wife. We're the ones that have I to forget. Be here. I remember one we. I weighed in because you could weigh in early. Finally, for the tournaments, it was like a local, and I remember needing to go to a Dick Sporting Good. And then also go to like a Dunkin' Donuts to get hot water, because I had to, I had to get a mug of hot water and I had to mo I mold yeah. their mouth guard because I don't I don't ever compete with that mouth guard. Yeah. And I think it might have been my wife back when she was like in, in the earlier belts, um, but I remember like the very vivid experience down in like Millersville going in this like forty five minute trip to like go mold and find a mouth guard because you can't I... get boiling water at like nine a.m. in most so, places. So Austin Open, I had to do that, but I had one. Thankfully, I, I always keep one in my house, like yeah. an extra mouth guard, and I shoved it in my bag, and I don't remember why I did it, and thankfully, I didn't have a mouth guard. So, uh, thank most hotels have a, yeah. have a microwave. Well, we had driven up for that. And then, so yeah, and then you just, mic well, no, I was in Austin. Yeah, so. you are in Austin. So, well, I, ha I have a, you, yeah. you have mouth guards? I have 40 of them. Do you really? Because I, <laughs> I buy them super cheap, and then when my students um, don't have, like, I have new students that yeah. come in that don't have mouth guards, they're college kids, and I go, you want a mouth guard? And they go, yeah, I would love it. And I go, you take a mouth guard. Like, it's, for me, but, I buy them, like, 10 like, cents a piece. But it's, like, the cheap, cheap ones. It's the cheap, cheap yeah. ones, but we're not doing striking, so they don't eat them. So, I, that's one of the things that, like, yeah, I don't I'm I don't tend to give stuff out a lot. I like the flat ones. But they're cheap, and yeah. I can protect students' teeth, and so I give them a 10-cent mouth guard. I'm like, hey, because I buy them big bolts yeah. of mouth guards to protect their teeth. I'm like, anyway. mold it, and, and then uh, inevitably, once or twice a semester, one will come, and like, oh, it hurts my teeth. Like, and they look at it, it's just the blank mouth guard. They never mold them. I'm like, yeah. you have to put it in hot water. And <laughs> they go, oh, and next week they come in, like, oh, it's way better now. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so wear mouth guard forks, or don't. You're adults. Do what you yeah. want. Uh, moving on to the next match, we have Douglas Lima versus Renat. Uh, give me his last name, Miranda. Fakhedronov? Yeah. I love watching Douglas Lima. Um, you have a note here for Renat. Has not lost in 10 years. Yes. And I looked it up. He has not lost in 10 years. In in MMA or grappling or any, either? Either. In anything. Jesus. He has not lost in 10 years. Dude, I, lo I, I love watching. I've watched Douglas Lima since like his early Bellator yeah. days. I really enjoy his game. I don't, I'm not really familiar with Renat. I should be now after this. Yeah. Because, I, man, he put I a wasn't, clinic on Douglas Lima. I wasn't either. Lima. And then I was like, nah, he had to have lost in 10 years. And I looked, nope, yeah, has not lost. And I mean, he's fought some, some you know big people and he just you know yeah he puts pressure. a clinic he puts a wrestling clinic <laughs> on douglas i mean douglas seems like not a bad grappler like no. it's definitely like no. a, one of the weaker sections of his game like a, a very good striker yeah but 
man, Bernard is scary. He just he just wrestled him. Oh, we forgot to mention the middle of the Denzel Freeman matches when like the whole telecast goes to a language that we we're not completely. Oh sure yeah, it was that was that was like the only there was two in the entire broadcast. There were two like glitches. One of them in the earlier matches they had the the time misaligned okay. on the screen, so you couldn't quite tell. Like, it was like yeah. just not quite lined up perfectly, and then. In that match, they went. I think what we think is Arabic. Yeah, they went. It to, was, it, I thought it was Portuguese. You're like, no, I was, like, yeah, oh, was it, it Arabic? It didn't have the Portuguese, you know, flavor. To we it. think they, for some reason, there's like a blip and it goes black for a second, and then it comes back in a language that we don't understand. I think it's Arabic, yeah. and then it's like one and a half matches in Arabic, yeah. and then it blips back, like seemingly with no reason, and then back into English. Yeah. And I was like, I guess we're back in English. Yeah. Like, yeah. Look, at least the broadcast didn't stop, and at least they had commentary. Yeah. I couldn't understand it. But they had well, commentary there. Well, I understood there. a few words. I understood yeah. freestyle. I heard Greco, and I heard <laughs> ADXC2, and I went, I know those words. Yeah, um, Denzel. That, that, that was, it's always Puya. really funny when you hear a bunch of language, <laughs> and then you hear Puya. I'm like, <laughs> they're talking about him. Okay, good to know. And the, da, 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 the freestyle. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, we were back in Take English. Down. <laughs> Um, yeah, Renat is a guy to watch. Yeah. Uh, I, again, I, this is me, my ignorance of like, he's probably a very known quantity in a lot of different yeah. disciplines. Um, but I was very impressed with how he was able to deal with Douglas Lima because Douglas Lima, he was in it the whole time, but this was Renat the entire three rounds. Yeah. Like really with Lima defending off the cage a ton for big pieces at this matchup. Um, we also have Ali Monafart Monaferi versus Talison Costa. That is a split decision for Talison Costa. We have Gabriel Souza versus Yuta Shimada. Uh, this one was close. You haven't listed as controversial. I think you think it was you think it was Yuta. I think it was Yuta, but I could be completely wrong. So I watched this, this with your note in mind. It's a weird like. It's close. It's, it's close. definitely close. I'll give it's, you that. It's close. I, I thought this would go this should go for Gabriel, but I do see I do see the argument you make for Utah. Well, only because if you watch the matches and you watch for how they're scoring the matches, they're normally giving more oomph to the party that is on top. I I also watched this in reverse order. Yeah. I started with the main event and watched yeah. in reverse order. They now. sort of are you giving You watched it live. Yeah, they sort of are giving the top party the, and the party that is more active and pushing forward mm -hmm. as being the winner. Now, in this situation, we do have Gabriel grabbing a couple different um, submissions on Yuta and Yuta having to get out of them. But we also have Gabriel pulling guard. And you watch him and he like sits really low and he pulls so he doesn't have to be... Which, doesn't have to do with Yuta's yeah, judo. Which I understand why you would do that, but at the same time, doesn't that kind of show that Yuta's better than you if Yuta, if you're afraid of Yuta's stand up? Right. And you're doing that so that you don't get thrown. I think that kind of makes Yuta look like the better stand up yeah, artist was, at that it's point. It's an interesting way so then to it becomes look at that like, score. Yeah. So then it becomes, is him, is he on top passing? Um, and Sousa just, Sousa's never held down, but Yuta gets out of everything. And it's just, it's. I it's one of those hard to score matches. Yeah. So I saw this and I, I, in my head, I went back to kind of more standard decision grappling yeah. scoring where it was like, okay, although Yuta is on top, Gabriel is the one in the majority, not, not the large majority, but yeah. the very slight majority of the scrambles and <sighs> initiation of the position, usually from bottom position. Yeah. And then even when he puts Yuta on his back, he's initiating, he's more aggressive in the, in the, in his looking to change positions okay. and initiate from the bottom, then he does get on top from the top. Even though Yuta has some really good, like, whenever they stand up, you see Yuta's yeah. takedown game come in immediately. Yeah. There was a really cool, and I'm blank on the name of the throw. It is a counter single leg that Yuta hits an inside uh, Tayatoshi on from the standing position. It's yeah. a really, really uncommon counter, you see. So uh, I, I'm. I want to say Tai Atoshi. It might be Tani Atoshi. I'm blanking on the names. It is the throw that you hit when you go far leg outside and you trip them both from behind, but you do it over both of the legs. Okay. Almost like you're doing a Sotogari, but you have your leg across both legs, and it's usually okay. a rotation throw, Okay. if that makes any sense. Yuta does that as a single leg counter to Gabriel Souza, yeah. just on the one leg 
inside the legs through. It's a yeah. it's a nuts counter that we see like maybe once a year. It is a really uncommon counter. It's there yeah. a lot, but very few people have the confidence in their judo to be able to do that. Yeah. Gabriel Souza, to his credit, on this throw, rolled. I watched it with my wife. Oh yeah, and she does. was like. He does well, roll. I was like, forward. Well, how good this is. She goes, yeah. yeah, but he gets rolled over. I'm like, yeah, but the takedown was cool. She goes, yeah, but he gets rolled over. She was, uh, immediately rolls him back over. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but it, the, the sequence is so cool. Yeah. But Yuta also used, he was, if you watch it in correct order, uh, Yuta, this is one of the first matches where you see somebody actually using the cage to their benefit. Um, you oh, hadn't I didn't seen think about it. that. You yeah. hadn't seen it, but Gabriel Souza um, gets him in a, what looks like a bow and arrow choke. And you just like yeah, you have this and in your you notes, just, and I, I, and you just sh- basically takes Gabriel's back and shoves him into the cage so that he can't like stretch himself out to really pull the bow and arrow. Mm-hmm. And he does, and a couple times um, when Gabriel's trying to push forward, Yuta gets him up against the cage so that he can't really do anything, and that he doesn't have that movement, that extra movement that's needed. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know and how I missed this. You talked about this in the yeah. pre-show, and I went, and "What with, sequence is this?" Yeah. Like, this whole sequence. Like, how did I miss yeah, that in watching with, this? And with gi, there's there's so many sequences where you have to stretch someone out because you're mm-hmm. holding onto their gi, so you have to stretch them. As opposed to Nogi where you're holding onto their actual body. And yeah. I think that when this is one of the weird things that when you take Gi and you put Gi in a cage, it's like an extra thing that no one thinks about. Because you can't you don't have the distance a lot of times to stretch guys out and away. Yeah. Whereas like in an open matted area, even or if, if you're, you're on the edge of the or mat, if you're you defending can turn. or if you're defending something, like let's say you're in a choke, but you know that like you know there's an extra little bit of space that you can get if you shove them up against the cage and that way they can't open an elbow or they can't do anything like that, then, you know, that becomes a situation where um, you have an advantage. And this was one of the first matches on the card that you see where somebody actually uses the cage to their advantage. Yeah. It was fun. Again, I I see the score. I see your argument now for potential that goes Utah. Um, But I also, like, I I saw this as for Gabriel, but I think it's interesting kind of your consideration of well, if you're pulling, and every time you stand up, Utah looks well, good in the stand up. I, I tell myself that because that's how I taught, made myself learn to wrestle. Because I was like, you know, if all these bitches sit down in front of me every single time I come up, that's a win for me because right. I don't have to worry about taking them down. Yeah. It was it's but. interesting, but it is an interesting consideration. Again, I don't think I don't think it's scored like that, but it is an interesting yeah. like consideration where if, well, if you are if you are avoiding a whole area. Should that be scored against you? Yeah. It's, it's an interesting discussion, I think, to be had. When we have another low week, I think yeah. the potential will bring it up again. Uh, and that does it for the main card on the prelim card, Miranda. I'm going to go through. You stop me where there's only, I think, one of these matches I'm super interested in talking about. We had Amir, uh, Ahmed Amir versus Mateus Arpas, uh, unanimous decision for Arpas. We had Omar Al Swali versus Shea Montag or Montague. I think it's Montague. I think it's Montague, kind of yeah. like. Romeo and Juliet. Oh, the house Capula. Of Ma- okay. The house yeah. of <laughs> this is a split decision for Shay. Um, I, this I wanted a little more out of this match. This is a matchup we were super amped yeah. for last week. Um, it My, was a lot of mirrored rooster weight yeah. double open guard with I think Shay doing more in the exchanges and pushing the pace. Not really pushing the pace, but just. And he was controlling the exchanges a yes. little better, and seemed to be putting the match where he wanted to put yeah. the match more than Omar. My uh, my child walks past the TV during this match, and she goes, "His mustache and his hair—that's just too much. That's just too much, <laughs> mom." And then just keeps on walking. Yeah, <laughs> it was. They both had the mustache. Yeah. Um. It was. Yeah. Again, I wish. I wish we would have seen more. Uh, positional work from yeah. both guys. They both wanted to play in the double seated open guard, which yeah. makes sense. They're rooster weights or flyweights here. Um, it is very much in the meta of those divisions. I'm not surprised. I just, we had a couple calls of inactivity. We had to re stand yeah. them up, and they just, we did not have as much positional work as I would have liked. If you're, if we're not going to see success in the footlocks or with the crab rhyme yeah. baron bolos or with any of the sequences were. You know, Shay or Omar was looking to get going. Yeah, they are really cool. But if you at the high level here with both these guys, if you can't get them going, then it looks like this, yeah. and it's just kind of unfortunate. I think for the flyweights, especially for this kind of game, I think this is where the three minute rounds. It's very unlikely you're going to get a much different match like yeah. this at these lower weights because these guys typically need more time to work those sequences. Yeah. Either 
it works immediately the first time for a guy like Musumeci the second time, yeah. or you see this protracted double seated open guard where both guys are fencing yeah. for a position. Let me look at how many Roosterweight Gi and Nogi World Finals we've had that look very much like yeah. this. And Shea is a you know a world champion in IBJJF. It makes sense that we would see the same style of matchup. Um, and I just wish we would have seen more from you know both guys out of that position. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the next match, we had Yara. Give me her name, Miranda. Kakish. Kakish. Okay. Versus Emily Ferreira, uh, formerly Emily Fernandez. I I completely missed that she changed her name. Yeah. No. And I, I was looking at. Her I was like, like she I kept, so familiar. I kept on looking at the last name, and I was like, that's not the last name I know you by. And like, right. I looked at it, and she had changed it on everything. Mm-hmm. So um, Emily Ferreira, uh, Emily Fernandez. We saw her most recently. Uh, she's a Bruno Bastos black belt. Yeah. We saw her on Fight Pass Invitational versus Helena Cravar. Yeah. In that matchup, and it was a big stepping stone for Cravar. And then Emily Fernandez comes out and shows, like, oh yeah, still very, very good. Yeah. Um, this is a really fun, like, armbar sequence. Um, you have it listed as a flying armbar, but not it's not really a flying armbar. Yeah. It's just more like she was picked up. Like she she had full guard, but then she like climbed up her, mm-hmm. and Yara tried to like stand up to get out of it, and so and then she Emily, was more of like trying to. It's like the standard uh, butterfly not butterfly guard, uh, flower sleep armbar essentially, yeah. where Emily makes the angle, scoops under Yara's leg, Yara tries to stand up out of it, and Emily collapses yeah. the knee back down to for- to sort of force Yara to kind of fall into her, and Fernanda can get her hips out to the side, yeah. and then turns her over, throws her over with the flower sleep armbar, and finishes it. It was just. It was a really nice sequence, and you saw like that one misstep by Yara yeah. when Fernandez, well, when and, Emily, I keep messing up her name. And you actually watched Emily do this exact thing multiple times during this yeah. match. Um, you this could was, tell exactly what she yeah, wanted. Yeah, and you could tell that that was her plan mm-hmm. of what she was going to be doing. It, this happens in round three. It's, you, know, yeah. you, you can see that like that's what she's looking for, that's what she wants, yeah. and is eventually able to make it work um, early in the first round. So we also have I mean anything anything else on that? Nope. We had Muhammad Al Al Swali versus Sang John or Sang Yong Ju. Uh, that was unanimous for Muhammad. And we had Alir Kulani versus Yaroslav Ramsk Rams Zep Ramjakev. Yeah. Uh, and that one, those are not correct at all. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, and that was unanimous for Yaroslav. Yeah. Uh, I think we're gonna see more from Yaroslav. Yeah. I I. Well, we've he's seen a, him before. He's a brand new brown belt. Yeah, we've seen him on something before. Yeah, uh, he's got a very unique name, and I'm like, I'm I recognize his name, and as a brand new brown belt, that is yeah. uncommon unless we're probably going to see more from you. I think he does a lot of the AJP stuff. Yeah, and, and again, I want I want to cover more of the AJP stuff. And well, now, if they're on this on this platform on this platform, then maybe, and they're only like, I think the next event for them is like ten bucks. So yeah, like, for the one of the GPs yeah. or something like that, we might do it again. They're the Majors are notoriously hard for us to cover, but I really, I really like the rule set yeah. for AJP. Like those short rounds, they're exciting. They're well produced. Like ugh, I wanna, I wanna make a better effort to kind of talk about those athletes because they're lesser known. Yeah, and that's a big piece of why we do the show is to talk about some of the lesser known athletes in the first place. So that's what I'm interested in. Um, so that does it for ADXC two. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It's five bucks. I like they have Gi and Nogi. Yeah. I wish they had longer rounds, but overall, um, a very, very good. Like I think a much improved event from the first one. Um, they have an, a bunch of matchups announced for the next one. They do. Uh, I think, well, not matchups, they have uh, people. Like Michelle Nicolini versus Fionn Davies. We have um, Jansen Gomez versus... They haven't said yet, but the one guy that won. It's probably going to be... Uh, Bruno, Bruno Lima, Lima yeah. uh, which is going to be a great matchup. We also, they have Cyborg in the next one. They have Big Dan on the next one. Um, they announced a bunch of like yeah. exciting, it's going to be in Brazil, so look for a lot of your Brazilian talent as well, but again, yeah. a- AJP does a really good job of international representation, I think way more than the IBJJF does, so it's uh, look, look for a really, really good card. Again, I'm happy that it's doing a third one. Um, especially if they're bringing this level of talent, you know, into yeah. grappling. And essentially, it looks like everyone's getting paid well, so yeah. that's something I like to see. So let's move on to Fight to Win th- uh, 234, I think, uh, in Miami. Do I have it up? 243. 243. What's up, dyslexia? Close, close. Um, this one is main evented by Lucas Lira Costa versus Zerao Costa. The Battle of the Costas. The Battle of the Costas. Really the battle of, like, former fight sports. Yeah. It was interesting. Um, Lucas Lira Costa is the, not to get into the, the drama of the matchup, but it was it was specifically interesting because this was in Miami. 
Um, Lucas Lear Costa is married to Maggie Grindotti, yeah. who is formerly engaged to Cyborg. Jao Costa is a cyborg, is a fight sports athlete. Yeah. And so you had essentially Grindotti coaching against Cyborg, Wagner, and Victor Doria yeah. three feet apart in Miami where they're all located. I was yeah. like, that had to have been a really a tense. very, very tense moment for both athletes and camps. Yeah. Um, and both guys, I think, well, looked good in this matchup. You have Lucas Lear uh, kicking Zhao Costa in the chest at one point. The yeah. chest head. I mean, it was a very... Uh, it didn't get that... Honestly, it didn't get as it, chippy as I It could have got a lot more chippy than yeah. it did. But it was, it was a good match. Mm-hmm. Really, I think what wins this match is... It's really Lucas Lear Costa... Lucas Lira on the bottom the majority of the match looking to play um, just standard, like not clamp guard, but looking to sort of climb up or climb underneath yeah. uh, Joao Costa. And Joao Costa doing a really, really good job initiating his passing, staying yeah. on top, pinning the legs down, getting across, trying to get through the guard. I yeah. think he almost gets past the guard like once. But we also have Lira trying, almost getting to his back a few times. Yeah. It's, it's a very good back and forth match, but really I think what we when we watch the match, yeah. we watch it together, we thought the the deciding factor here was Rao Costa's pressure on top and yeah. his control on top. He just seemed more in control of the exchanges. Oh um, no, yeah, and we have it was Zhao Costa. We have him almost getting to Lear, Lear's back. Okay, Lear's back. You said not that. the was, other, yeah. not the other way around. It was it yeah. was Costa. I think that near back take yeah. is is what it's a close match with Costa. I think doing more. You can't say Costa because they're both Costa. Oh, sorry, that that makes sense. <laughs> with with Zhao. Joao. <laughs> uh, almost getting to L- Lucas Lira's back, yeah, and controlling in the yeah. guard as the passer yeah. more. It's again very close, but I, I can't imagine how stressful it is for both athletes and both camps yeah. to be in that situation. Um, but again, both guys performed really well, yeah. and I do. There was a bunch of other fun matches on the card, but we're already going a little bit long. I like that um, fight to win is back in Miami. I it oddly was dark. Usually, fight to win is really, really well lit. Yeah. This one was a little weirdly dark. Um, I hope that they bring those lighting bars back out that they used to have at all the events. Yeah. Because I really been, like how it bright it was. It just might have been that that facility. Yeah, it might have been the venue as well. Uh, but usually, fight to win is really, yeah. really, really well lit, and this one was a little darker. Yeah. So, but overall, fun matchup. Uh, cool to see Jacques to take that in Miami for his team. Yeah. Moving on, we are into the preview section. Miranda, where do you want to start for the previews? I know where I want to start. Okay, well, we're going to go into Muhammad Ali real quick. He's not, he hasn't gone yet. Okay. He's fighting tonight in Houston. I, okay. I want to see him just. You're so excited about I this I want to see him because it's been, it. it's one of those things that if he wins, we all knew he was going to win. If he loses, holy shit. Yeah. Holy but it, shit. But, it is, it's, it, <laughs> but again, it's heavyweight MMA. Yeah. So you don't know. I mean, happen. you know. You, that's I've seen some of the sparring footage that he's put out. Like, man, they're they yeah. banging in I've, his training uh, room. Well, it's TLI. They've well, no, always, he's at his own gym now, remember? Yeah, but they're still TLI. Yeah. They still, he's, he's been brought up in a gym where you go 150% mm-hmm. every day. Yep. And you just, you they bust go, it. They you go bust hard. it until it breaks, you know? Yep. Um, so that'll, that'll be Muhammad anyway. Ali he's making his MMA. We usually don't cover a lot of MMA on the show, but no, when but, it, but our rule is when a big name grappler yeah. makes a debut, we talk like Bouchesha, Yuri Samos, uh, Gary Tony when he made yeah. his debut. Well, we just had Gordon um, Ryan go against Muhammad Ali back in the day in DC. And Gordon, oh, um, the Gordon, canceled fight to win event. Yeah. I forgot about that. Well, that was that and IBJJF. Because at one point Gordon oh, was registered. Gordon registered for the DC Open. Yeah, and everyone registered for yeah, that division. Remember yeah. that? Yep. Anyway, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. Moving on, we have 1FC, Rotolo versus Langacker 2. Uh, I'm excited about this. Yeah, because we have Rotolo. I just had a question. I was like, I was like, which Rotolo was it? For some reason, I thought it was Ty. I was like, that can't no, be right. No, and Cade, win- Cade won the last match. Um, decision, I think. Decision, yes. It was. It was okay. a decision. Well, but it was, it was a close decision, too. Yeah. It wasn't a... Um, it was a close decision late. Where yeah. it's like he really put it on Langacker later in the yeah. matchup, and Langacker had yeah. some really good exchanges. I think honestly, it it is the match to make in one FC. I think there's some really fun matchups. I think we also have Ty Rotolo scheduled to go against Isaac Bichelle coming yeah. up as well, which is another really good matchup, especially with Ty calling Isaac out because he yeah. was like, Isaac's one of the top guys in the world. He wants to get it. Let's do it. This matchup again with how close the last matchup for to, between Tommy Langacker and Cade was is a really good one to make. Um, now let's get into Tommy Lanker posted a video of, his of it's his, somebody on a couch next to him watching him get heel hooked by Taza and not tap. And then it's Tommy Lanker holding his foot up 
and then turning his entire foot upside down almost inverting the entire foot just like just on the couch just like turn like no he's not turning with yeah, his hand he's not using his it just, he's just using the muscles in his leg to turn his to, leg you upside have to down. just find it it's on it's on tommy's instagram page and i watched it and then i literally sat there with my foot and like was like can i because i'm a flexible person i think yeah. and i was like can i do this Oh, you can't even get halfway Dude. the direction that he does it. And then I it's was like, like old school David Blaine when David Blaine like turns his yeah. whole leg around and I pops the like, whole thing. Yeah, I was like, holy hell! And he's like, he was like, I don't know why people still try to heel hook me. Right, from side foot lock me still. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it was it was gr- it, it look his leg looks fine, but it's super gross to yeah. watch. <laughs> um, I do not think Kid Rotolo will be able to nope. like heel hook him. Nope, not gonna. I happen. do not. If, if Oliver Tazla can't do it, yeah. Uh, again, the, the Vitola brothers have great leg locks. Yeah. Nah, like, he's going like, to have to choke him. And I don't think Langer's going to tap no. to a choke. I think he's going he's gonna to go Langer out. Langer go out. You're going to have yeah. to put him out. I think this is really close. I I will give this to Cade. I think Cade takes this. Yeah. Um, I think this is closer than the last match. Okay. Um, I am curious though. Lanark has been really active yeah. in his Taza match, in his Euros see, matches. Yeah. Like, is he... Well, is he getting this weekend? We'll see what happens. Yeah, um, who did Langacker go against? Joseph Chen. Yeah, at trials. <sighs> yeah, I think I think given Cade's recent resume and Langacker's recent resume, like again, I picked this for Cade again. The first match was close. I think Langacker is a guy who's made made a ton of improvements over the years. We've talked about Tommy Langacker since we started the show in 2016. Um, the Atos guys tend to make big improvements quickly, but my question is, how much is Cade and his brother Atos? Yeah. And how much are they in Costa Rica? They seem to be in Costa Rica. A they lot. seem to be in Costa Rica a lot, and but they have each other. And but that's but you you have a is copy. your brother your coach? But you have a copy of yourself. You do. But my big question yeah. is, they are young enough in their career. I am always concerned with young super athletes like the Bertola brothers. Yeah. Going out, having a ton of success, and then leaving what got them to the dance. Like, oh, okay. leaving a camp. Because we've seen it time and time again with MMA fighter prospects. Yeah. Like, they get in, they get really good, they get ranked, then they make a drastic change. Yeah. They take a loss, they make a drastic change, and they never get to where they were going to, they were projected yeah. to go because they started coaching themselves. They got a different coach. Yeah. Like, I'm curious if that vast and, and staggeringly quick level of improvement we saw from the Tolo brothers. If that potentially is going to level off now that they are running their own thing in Costa Rica, they're building their gym, they're yeah. not under every day in Atos with Andre Galvao and with that whole Atos team improving like they were. Yeah. So I don't think that we're going to see that drop off here versus Tommy Langacker, but I'm curious and concerned that potentially AAK has the championship for ADCC. Like, how much in the room is yeah. he? Now that he is not in the IBGDF circuit, now he's not in the ADCC circuit, now he's not in the open circuit, like, we just see him occasionally, is he full-time training like he once was with these events super frequently, or is he now, like, going into camp for 1FC and not training as much in the off-season because him and his brother yeah. are both on that schedule? So that's that's my concern. Yeah. Do you have, I, you have I, any I'm uh, thoughts? Go, I'm gonna go for Lang Anchor. You you're gonna go Lang Anchor. I'm gonna go Lang Anchor just to be just to be contrite about the whole thing. How do you think you think he subs him or you think he, he decisions him? You think it's close decision? I think it's close to decision. I think we also get a really nasty Lang Anchor moment where he, like part of his body almost falls off and then <sighs> he comes back and wins. Yeah. Like again, we jo- Josh <laughs> coined on a term on the podcast years and years ago. Like if there's anyone that can pull a rabbit out of their hat at any moment yeah. is Tommy Lacker. That dude can flash sub almost anyone in the world. Um and he's done it throughout all the years. Like he's down, he's down, he's down, boom, flash sub. Yeah. Um and him and Felipe Andrew, I think, are the best guys in the world at that. Also on this card, this is a dope card. We have Shinya Aoki. It is on January twenty eighth, by the way. It's not next weekend, so we can after. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. <sighs> All right, well, oh, Shinya Aoki yeah. versus... I thought it was this next weekend. No. I got excited. Right? No, you're right. That's eight days from now. Oh, no, it is next weekend. Oh, we're recording the podcast on Saturday. Yeah. That's why. It is next weekend. Okay, okay. it is next weekend. Okay. Um, but we it's got, Sunday. That's the problem. So it doesn't seem like it is. I'll it is. figure it out. Whatever. It's in Tokyo. Yeah. We have Shinya Aoki versus Sage Northcutt. We have Super Lekimoto versus Takaru Sagrada. Like, that's a dope main event. 
We have Gary Tonin versus Martin Wynn, um, and then a bunch of other fights on the card. But those four fights at the top of the at the top of the card a, are amazing. Is is that a? It's on it's on Prime, I think. Yeah, I think it's a Prime. A prime. Uh, I don't know. It says pay per view at one FC, but I think it's a Prime match. I think this is the international card. Yeah. For this, so we're looking at Topology. Topology has the the poster for yeah, it. Yeah, but I think it's on Prime. I think it's on Prime in the yeah. U.S. I think we have the international poster, which is the pay per view at one FC dot com. Yeah. Regardless, it's going to be an amazing yeah, card. I'm super excited for it. Six MMA bouts, a kickboxing bout, a grappling bout um, in Japan. So, super looking forward to that one. So, we have Enigma, the 5-on-5 five five quintet. We talked about this a little bit before. Um, yep. The teams have been announced. They're up here somewhere. Oh, you have them? Yeah, they're up okay. there. Oh, you got them already? Yeah. Nice. And We have um, a lot of super fights on the card. Um, for the Sorry, you want to take them or want me to take them? No, it? we can go... Just so, run through the teams, and so then we'll move. for the teams, we have... Ooh, that didn't make it any, any larger. Nope. Um, St. Petersburg, Florida. We have Quintet 515. We have Team Enigma. We have Abraham uh, La Montag. We have Reese LaFlair. We have Darren J. Corbray, Hunter Colvin, Kaya Rudolph, Team Sapatero. And all these teams are, are veterans of those promotions. Yes. So people that have actually been on... Those promotions before, the promotions yeah. got teams together and sent them out to to Sapatero for this event. Yeah. We have te- so these people are actually not just like random teams to put together, but actually people that represent some of the best that that promotion yeah. has had on. Uh, we have Team Sapatero. We have Adrian Nez, John Combs, Max Hanson, Andres Proferio, and Ryan Aiken. We have Team Midwest Finishers. We have Sergi- Sergio Ardilla. We have Chris Wojcik. We have David uh, Stoli. We have Ernesto Rivera, Rivera and Paul Ardilla. Good luck. Oh, Paul Ardilla. Yeah, I didn't right? see him. Yeah, just, and he's, he's in the back. He's, well, his, it, his brother's on that side, too. Yeah. Sergio's on there. It's the, both Ardilla brothers yeah. and Stoli on that one. And Chris Wojcik. That's, that's a Yeah, and team. Wojcik, which that's a, that's a rough. Mm-hmm. We have, in Team Finishers, we have Sergio Velas. We have Sean DeMarco. We have Ethan Cronston. We have Renee Souza and Kieran Kuchuk. I still like that Midwest finishers. That's Dude, a hard one. You got Paul Ardell. But again, it's Quint. But then you have, but then you have Max Hansen, which Max, Max Han- Hansen and Ryan Aiken, who is a monster in yeah. combat jiu-jitsu. You have DeAndre Corbury and Hunter Colvin. Yeah. And the other, like this is honestly, it'll be interesting. In looking at these full Depending team announcements, how, yeah, I'm really curious about. It this depends one. on how they how they set up their teams too. Yep. Um, it is. In looking at the size, I'm curious what the weight, uh, what the weight cutoff was for these guys because. I think, is it under 170? What What do you mean under 170? Um, Ardilla is not under 170. Oh, good point. Because so sometimes for quintet events, there's a couple different ways they can run them, and, and they probably yeah. listed it. They probably have it here. I'm actually in the one of the matchmaking yeah. chats for this. Um, for quintets, it's usually done one of two ways. It is everyone under a certain weight. Or they have a max. Or they have a maximum weight for your entire team. Or sometimes they have you have to like like um, like subversive does. You field members at certain at certain weight classes, and then anyone can go against anyone. I so I don't know how they're it doing. It might it for be this that one. they're fielded because if you look at it, they're kind of all people from different weight classes or from similar weight classes. Yeah. You know what I mean? They you all have a 55er, have... you have a 45er, yeah. you have a 70er, you have an 85er. Yeah. And then you have Ardilla, who's like a 205er. Yeah, but you have, I think Sean, Sergio is also bigger. Sean's also big, Sean's too. Sean's bigger. Yeah. So you have some larger gentlemen. Yeah. So we'll and Hunter, s- Hunter Cove is also bigger, yeah, too. He's, so an, he's an 85er. Yeah. Comfort, I mean, so I mean, we'll cutting see. to get there. We'll see how it goes. but yeah. It's a really um, great. I'm, I'm honestly, I don't know how much this card is. I think it's a little more than I wanted, but I think, oh, it's on Enigma. We have Enigma. Okay. We're good to go. Well, you have Enigma. I don't. We'll right. have to, we'll we'll, have to share. We'll all get Enigma. We'll share. Um, the, uh, I the forget Enigma. exactly how much the card is. But it's like six nine nine a month. Yeah, I think this also includes it. Seven bucks. This card is absolutely worth seven bucks. Yeah, like support support pro grappling. These guys, all these promotions are getting together. Some of their most exciting yeah. grapplers. Seven bucks. It's worth it. Um, we, have, we, we have the pit submission karate or pit oh, su- yeah. submission series. Is it karate combat? So karate combat is putting together a new organization. And the new we organiza- don't have to go deep into this because this is coming up in a while. It came up today. No, it's coming. No, but I mean, it's not happening for a while. January 26th. Oh, okay. It's happening this week. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're just announcing shit later. They're announcing it today. So oh, okay. as of today, um, so so Pit Submission Series looks to be a... It, okay, so let's... We don't have to go deep into this. 
because these are the fun things to go deep into. I know, but we've already we went like Euro. two hours into the shit. We still got Euros. Stuff Euros do. <laughs> give, me, give me give me one minute. Yes. So karate combat is Boss Rutan's thing. Uh, Josh Palmer's the commentary commentary for it. So it was Angela Hill. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. A couple of events ago, or like one or two events ago, they had a bunch of like a bunch of famous people out of it. Yeah. And they had a bunch of grapplers, and we were like, yeah. like Craig Jones was there, the Meow Brothers were there, was, and there's other grapplers, and we were all like, that's kind of weird. They had a lot of grapplers there. And didn't really think much of it. Yeah. It was like, but it's odd because usually promotions don't bring grapplers out. And yeah. It was interesting that they did. We just found out that Paulo Meow or the Meow Brothers yeah. are now running pit submission fighting, essentially, out of the karate combat bowl. Like bowl oh, pit. okay. And so it looks like a joint venture or karate combat is now running this and it's headed by the Meows it, or something. Is it at the is it at the big the big thing that looks at you? The big ball in vegas that looks at, at the sphere the sphere i don't think okay. it's at the sphere i got excited the first time i saw it i was like is this thing at the sphere because i want to see something there but i don't see anything fun yeah. so we have we have two matchups we can talk about and one leaked fighter we can't talk about his matchup yet because yeah. i just got they were like don't tell don't talk about it yet um we have helena Corvar versus uh what is murdoch's first name uh, i don't uh kate yeah. versus kate murdoch um, that is uh, CJ Murdoch's wife. Yes. Also a very good black belt, frequent competitor versus Helena Cravar. Um, again, another another pretty decent stepping stone for Cravar. Yeah. Uh, Murdoch is a frequent competitor. She's she a black does belt. well in the opens. Does a bla- is a black belt. Yeah. Been a black belt is for it? a while. Is, is a it? very experienced competitor. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't, didn't mean stepping stone in like a in a derogatory term, but like we've we've seen Cravar. On super fights, we've seen her in tournaments against the top and best in the world. And we've seen super fights. We haven't seen her frequently take on really high level female black belts. And we're starting to see people and starting to see her in those matchups now. And and Murdoch is, I think, another really good one of those matchups. Is what I meant. I didn't mean to speak it like that. Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. So we have her, and then we also have Big Dan Manasur versus Max Jimenez, which we all know Max. We all know Max. Max is local to us. Yeah. Um, went out three hours ago. Nice. So that that is a crazy matchup. Like again, Big Dan has looked. The, yeah. The big weird thing about this matchup is these are heavyweights. This is in a bowl pit. Yeah. So it's essentially if you've never seen karate combat, watch karate combat. It's a lot of fun. It's. It's in a matted area, and then there are like 45-degree, yeah. four-foot walls that come up the side that you can use. So I'm guessing for grappling, we are going to see guys pushed up against the corners here of this mat. Because yeah. if, if Karate Combat has some grappling, too, a little bit. Um, it'll be really weird to have two giant guys like Max Jimenez and Big Dan in this pretty small fighting area. Yeah. And it's going to be on the wall. So... Again, I give I I love Max. I give the edge to Big Dan. Big Dan has looked nigh unbeatable, especially with his with his match at West at East Coast Trials. Yeah. And then look at his match at Victor Hugo, one of the best in the world. Almost gets the better of Victor Hugo before getting kind of tired at the end yeah. and having Hugo be able to beat him. But man, Big Dan is a handful to deal with. Uh, we also have Luke Griffith on the card. The Atlanta Kovar announced. Yeah, can't say who he he who he is against. Um, but uh It'll be a fun one. It it is a wild. It is wild that the matchup got made. Okay. I'll put that. There is a bit of a size difference. Okay. But man, the guy he's going against is game as hell. Good to know. Good so, to know. So uh I gotta wanna leak it so bad, but I, I wanna I wanna respect that, <laughs> that they let us know who it was. Um it, it it's a it's a fun matchup. It'll be uh, it will answer some questions about a lot of things, okay. uh, but it's Luke Griffith, and it'll be it'll be super fun to watch. So that that's happening the twenty sixth. Yeah. I don't know how to watch it. We are literally just finding out about this today. Yeah. So I'm guessing it's a thing that like CFFC runs Fury Grappling the day before yeah. Submission Underground ran their event before their event their MMA event in yeah. Oregon. I'm guessing that Karate Combat is doing that, like running a grappling event the day before they run their premier event. Yeah. And again, I love that grapplers are getting some shine and getting an opportunity to go out and showcase grappling in these sort of organizations. So pit submission uh, pit series s- submission series out of the karate combat pit. So it'll be fun. All right. It's uh, on like caffeine something. Oh, it is on the documentary service. Like caffeine mm-hmm. TV or something. Caffeine.tv. Yeah. Um, okay. So, Miranda, I'm going to let you drive this one. Yeah. Moving gonna... on to our preview of the IBJJF European Championships. Yeah. So, um, 
we kind of have brackets, sort of, kind of. But that would take a million years for us to go through them all. And we've already talked to you guys. So we're going to tell you a couple matches that are going to be fun. A couple uh, competitors to look out for. And then we can kind of go from there. And the Black Belts begin on Friday. And they uh, go down to, I want to think, semis. And then they do semis and finals. Yeah, I think that's correct. On Saturday. Yeah. I believe that's how it works. And then open class is still open. So it won't be until Thursday until you know who's in the open yeah, class. Yeah, and black belts, because they are black belts, don't have to meddle in their division. Yeah, they can just, they can just enter. And so yeah. the black belt opens are usually but, much, much larger than the colored belt if opens. But you, if you refuse to, if you don't show up at your open match, they take you out of no, your... No, your division match. No, it's the other way around. It's oh, you, really? open is first. Because they do the oh, open divisions before. I didn't before. know that. They do the open oh, I knew that. I didn't know that. They, they do the open vision, divisions before they do the weight divisions. Mm -hmm. And it's a rule that if you don't show up. If you open, scratch your open, they you scratch, scratch your division. Yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've because they don't, want, they don't want people. To just register and not do. Exactly. And then mess up the brackets. Yeah. Which is, I think, that's a reasonable rule. If you sign up yeah. for it, you got to show up for it. Um, it kind of sucks when you think about if you cut weight for your division. Because that means you're coming in at whatever mm -hmm. weight you are. And if you're doing a major like the Euros, which yeah. is the first major of the year for IBJJF, you're, most guys are cutting a little bit of weight to get there because you want to be big and strong for your division. Yeah. Rooster weight, we have a fun match. Um, In we have round Sh one. Shay Montag, who we just saw this week on ADXC versus Tadaya Danforth, a guy yeah. that's local to us, but also like been really, really killing it on the rooster weight scene yeah. um, and yeah. been very active for many, many years. I did an interview with him at Fight to Win 70. I think when he was a purple belt still. Okay. Um, that'd be a fun match. Yeah. It's a tough match for Tadaya, but he again took we took that win over Esteban Martinez. So. Yep. They go Saturday because that's a uh, semi match. Yep. And then uh, we go to Light Feather. Um, saying that they both win, we're gonna have. I like how I wrote this because I didn't know how to how to like. Kaina. His, it's his last name is Kaina. It's Zachary Kaina. Zachary, the Hawaiian AOJ gentleman. Yeah. Uh, Zach Kaina. Versus yeah. uh, Malachi Edmund. Um, and that's round two. That is a Saying really that they both exciting win. matchup. Now, who knows if they both win their first round, but how they're ranked and how they, they generally perform, I would assume both of them yeah. come in. And they that's a match of them together, which mm -hmm. would be fun. Um, and and then, again, there's always big upsets at these at these majors. Yeah, so yeah. The, one of these, some of these matches could not happen. But looking at the big names in the bracket, that's kind of what we're trying to bring you is like the biggest names in the bracket. There were things we're most likely to see, not discounting the other athletes yeah, in the brackets, and, but and if you're, just by the rankings. Yeah, and if you're like browsing through uh, Flow and you see these names, you'll know to like you know yeah, yeah. pay attention and mm -hmm. watch it. Um, you also have uh, Frank Suspitas and Diego. Oliveira Bautista. Mm -hmm. Those that's the other quarterfinal match. Yeah. Feather. So, uh, and then we go into featherweight. We have uh, Kennedy uh, Maciel and, and Sam McNally. They're in different sides of the bracket, which they should be. And then we have Isaac uh, Doderline in the second bracket because there's yeah. two brackets uh -huh. that all have to go. And Doderline's ranked number one. Yeah, and he is the mm -hmm. number one ranked. So that makes sense. So, we're pro so Doderline and Kennedy are on the. I are on different brackets. Different brackets. Are they on the same side? Oh no, they'll be so they only meet. Yeah, yeah, they, they would meet only finals. meet if they win the entire thing. So yep. Kennedy, we have a possible Kennedy Masiel versus Sam McNally at one point. Mm -hmm. Um, but then we would only have one of them then go against Isaac. Yeah, if Isaac makes it through his entire so, bracket. So again, that so. Kennedy looked amazing at Aiga. Like yeah. that wrestling was on point. His match with Gabriel. So the Gabriel Sosa. Look at him, the match versus Yusha yeah. Shimada this weekend, and Kennedy submitted Gabriel Souza. Like Kennedy, yeah. I think might be back, um, and I'm curious to see you know how he looks in the lead up to eight ADCC again, yeah. to looking to take that second ADC title after his performance last year or last year he wasn't able to defend his title. Yeah, and then uh, we go into lightweight. We have the two gentlemen that we saw earlier uh, this week. We have es Espen. We have Espen. Matisson. Matisson. We think. If you know uh, the name, please let in, us know. Yeah, and he's ranked number three, and he's in the first bracket. And then in the second bracket, bracket we have Paolo uh, Lavaselli, who's, mm -hmm. who we went against. Um, the problem is we also have Elijah Dorsey in that bracket number two. So we might yeah. not get the, the ADXC um, replay match. Yeah, or the World Pro match or, or yeah. whatever. Yeah, we've seen it a bunch. Um, we might not have that match again if we, Elijah Dorsey uh, brings it. But this is in the gi, and we've seen him a lot have a lot of – um, Not a lot of trouble, but like we, he has been less successful in the gi than he has in no gi, yes. especially with the ADCC trials win. Yes. So yeah, potentially going to see Pablo versus Elijah Dorsey. I am uh, again since uh, we should have known about Elijah before because he's local. We've seen him locally before, yeah. but that that trials performance really catapulted him yeah. into like the putting a lot well, of eyes on him. And he has it in his. 
progress to black belt, he has had some rough matches at black belt. Yeah. So he has not always made it to those championship matches due to matchups with highly ranked guys. Yes. Yeah. That, so it'll, be, um, it'll be curious yeah. coming off the heels of his trials win yeah. what he looks like. So that was lightweight. Um, yeah. Pablo, Espen, and Elijah are the big names in that one. Middleweight. Yeah. Middleweight, we have uh, the return of Michael Galvan. Well, we did, and then now he's out for who's number one, isn't he? Nope, he's still there. He's in brackets. I double-checked it. Oh, I thought we were talking about, okay. We So no. earlier we talked about something else, and he was no, out. No, that's Lovato. Oh, Lovato that's what, okay, is the one that was in was. that's now out. Oh, okay. but Micah, Micah, like no, and I looked at the name because it's it's Mickey L. Mickey, yeah. And I was like, is that his real that first name? And then yes, that is his real. Yeah, Mickey Gaval. Yeah, but we have him. He's number two actually. He's behind someone else. Yeah, but he's um, been out for suspension. Yeah. And now he's back. Like again, anyone again? He's not. We well, see him more nogi. He's but, behind Andy Mar- Marasaki. So. Well, I mean, that's yeah. a matchup I want to see. Well, they're in two different brackets, so the possibility they both bring their and that's, brackets. And that's how they should be. They should yeah. be bracketed on the opposite sides. That'll be a really fun matchup. Well, and we definitely have uh, – IBJJF does bracket well. I do have do. to give that to them. Yeah, yeah. Because then they they also do if they if you have two teammates they generally um, switch them out and move them around. Yeah, and, and they also stuff. you can do swaps and stuff. Yeah. And like they they have a very friendly bracketing system. If you yeah. are in one of the big camps, and most of the best people in the world are yeah. in a big camp, and so well, there's also they get favorable. There's bracketing. also rules where if yeah. you you can only have two competitors in a bracket. That's why you have Cicero Acosta and Cicero Acosta International National, for all yeah. the meows, always in that like feather yeah. bracket. Yeah. So there, there are ways to get around it. You also have Tariq Hopscotch, which is, I think, fun because yeah. he's the— Yeah, Tariq is, 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 fu- uh, is fun to watch. Yeah. Um, so, and he's in Mika Gavao's bracket, so potentially yeah. we're going to see that matchup between Tariq Hopscotch and Mika Gavao in yeah. the first bracket for middleweight. Uh, then we go into medium heavy, and we have uh, Uanderson. One of your fa- one of your favorites, Uanderson. Uanderson Ferreira. Yeah, and we also have Clay Mayfield, which is a pedigo guy. Um, Clay's been, like— we don't talk about him a ton on the show, but he comes up a lot when I'm looking up like highlights of guys at yeah. like the Pedigo guys. I'm really curious if he's gonna like make that switch yeah. and like take a major. It'd be, it would be nice yeah. to see. Yeah, Anderson nice. again had a rough matchup. What two weeks ago? Yeah, versus um, Lima. Lima, Bruno Lima. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we talked about it in that preview. So again, it'd be, it'd be cool to see Mayfield. He's one of the, he's again he's one of the few Guy Pedigo guys that yeah. we see. He's one of the, he's again he's a big dude. Um, in represent rep and pedigo in the yeah. gi. And then uh, we go into heavy, and they just have one bracket. So all these gentlemen are at different corners of the bracket. But we have Felipe Andrew. We have Adam Orzinski, and we have Pedro Hen- Henry. Yeah. It would uh, be really cool to see Adam Orzinski be able to continue that streak, streak one match, over yeah. Felipe Andrew. Felipe Andrew has taken the vast majority of those matchups. Yeah. But that comeback of the year for 2023 happened. Really curious if he can maintain that momentum into this match, or Felipe yeah. Andrew will like turn it around well, again. And we, and and not... But we've also seen him, you know, do very, very well in uh, Nogi. Yeah. And almost make an almost win, you know, in Nogi and lose to a teammate. So yeah, Adam. Again, I'm, um, I'm a huge fan of Adam Morzinski. Again, he, I play, play a very similar game personally, so I really want to see. I like like watching yeah. his game because he's one of the few guys that plays that style of game at the highest level. Um, but Morzinski, another thing typically does really really good at euros like he shows up for euros and yes. so i'm very very curious if you can continue that over felipe andrew um for that one heavyweight bracket yep. so we'll see and then super heavy we have eric muniz mm-hmm. um, he's the biggest name in that bracket yeah and ultra heavy uh we've gutenberg but, gutenberg we've, Pedata. but we have him since he changed over to AOJ. yeah that'll be interesting like if they are i'm curious to see I don't think we're going to get any drastic shifts to Gutenberg yeah. Pedata's game immediately. It's been AOJ, what, a month? Less than a month. A couple weeks. Yeah, that, but that we know of. That, sorry, that we you know, know of. So he's probably been there a little bit, but yeah. actually officially made the switch over. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm really curious to see if we what differences in game yeah. we see from Gutenberg Pedata after moving to AOJ. That's, yeah. a really, that's a really cool note and there. And then in the Masters divisions, we have Zhao. Uh, Mayo. Yep. Of course, he's in uh, Master One Light Feather, and we have Josh Hinger. He's a Master Three Middle, which I'm like, oh man, that's Could not you fair. You imagine being a Master Three Middleweight man and look at your bracket and be like, oh, oh cool, shit. I got Josh Hinger. Shit, I... awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck to me. <laughs> because you also know What's that. Like Josh Hinger in the gi, you're you, like, yeah, man, my head still also, exists in the yeah, gi. And you also know that that means he's doing absolute in the gi. 
He'll do Master oh. Three Absolute. So you can be, you can think you're the shit at Master Three. Uh oh, you got. Oh, cool. I got Ma- I got Josh Hanger <laughs> in the gi. <laughs> you're gonna take my head off with an arm and guillotine. Yeah. Um, and Lovato, I can't find Lovato on any of the brackets. He's in the posters. He's in the posters. Which I was like. Dude, Lovato's on the poster. He has to be in these brackets. Nah, he's not. <laughs> so I don't know. But if he shows up somewhere, that'd be great because I love be cool. watching him. But he doesn't seem to be in the brackets. Um, and then we go over to uh, the females. Um, and we have definitely smaller brackets. Uh, and, yeah. And a lot less competitors that at least I'm aware of. Like I hear of regularly. Yeah. I Let's honestly, that way. even for the female brackets, I tend to really, with the men, I've figured out a lot of their secondary names. Yeah. For IBGF, I still yeah. really struggle with a lot of the female names because um, I, I the last names change occasionally, which yeah. throws me off. But I just, I tend to really struggle well, still and with the IBGF they call female them, names. A lot of times they call them by a name that doesn't even come show up. up on yeah. the listing. And I'm yeah. like, what the hell? You know. So we, we are probably missing some females here yeah. for these brackets, but the big ones that we have, especially in Life Feather, we have rank number one, Misa Bastos. Yeah. Probably going to take Life Featherweight. Yeah. And we have uh, Margus uh, Cicerelli at Featherweight. Yep. Uh, we have Dilita Silva and Raquel Canuto both at Middleweight. Mm-hmm. And then we have Maria um, Maliasic. Maliasic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vanessa Griffith and Leticia Cordoza. Yeah, uh, at medium heavy. Medium heavyweights we have fun we have fun division this year. I don't know. Do you remember if we don't have her listed here? Do you remember if Liz Mitrovic? Is, no, I uh, didn't see her name. On okay, there. yeah, I was no, curious because she her. just had a really really good performance at Worlds. Yeah, and I, I was just curious if she was in this because I hadn't seen her name either. I, d- I didn't see it, and we have Vanessa Griffith going against Letitia first round. Yeah, which will be a fun one. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's Euros in a glance, but it will be going on all week. Yep. So um, we'll be. I'll be coming back from business travel, watching some Euros, and then we will probably have to pick what we're going to cover next week. If you have some yeah. preferences for what we're going to cover, it'll probably be mostly IBJJF Euros. But again, I'm really interested in the quintet stuff. Really, I mean, everything we talked about this week, yeah. I'm actually really interested in. It really depends on what happens. Yeah. I mean, it might be a long ass show next it'll week. Probably, yeah, it might be one of those like, hey, two hour shows like we just I'm did. I'm trying to think if there's, yeah. I don't we'll, think there's anything going on. We'll figure it out. But again, yeah. that's uh, it should be a we are out of the lull of grappling in a very big way with fo- with four big events this next week. Um, absolutely worth a couple of your dollars here and there for some of these to support uh, yeah. the promotions paying out athletes and grapplers. Should should be a lot of fun. Zach and I are doing commentary on Copa Elite three uh, February tenth. If you are in the Virginia area and you want to come out and watch some really fun grappling, we have guys like Yuta Shimada are on that card as well. You will be at the ADCC Open. You will be at the Atlantic Open. City. A lot of folks will be at the ADCC yeah. Open in Atlantic City. But if you're in the Virginia area, you want to hear Zach and I uh, talk about some matches, you can tune into the stream yeah. or you can actually come and buy tickets and watch it live. They're really fun. They're produced very well. Yeah, it, I'm kind of upset that it's the same day. Yeah. There's a lot of things going on that day. Dude, it's, it's it gets busy, man. Like January is a little bit of a lull in that this third week in January yeah. really kicks up and we forget like, oh right, uh, the lull is over oh, and we are in what? the middle the of stuff. The other thing is sometime in the middle of uh, March is is Naga at the convention center in Baltimore. Oh, we, oh that's coming up too, isn't and it? I was and then, like, and I was we like, have trials. Yes. Trials is in March. We're yeah. still trying to get tickets out that are under a thousand bucks. I have a not, it hasn't hit yet but i have a super fret at toro yeah you have your toro stuff March, so yeah it, it gets busy real yeah. quick so we're not got nothing else other than i'm flying yeah. out for business travel this whole week for the first time actually first time i've done a week-long business travel in probably like seven years oh, it's been, wow. a, long, See, I it's travel, been a long time you I travel, travel all the time i travel all the time for work so i'm like used to it yeah it, i still get nervous and like i got stuck in charlotte a couple weeks ago not days ago maybe at this point but yeah i have a like, real i have a real quick layover for one of my flights and i'm just like hoping it turns out well because we've had it'll be fine. we've had we didn't have snow for the past two years here in baltimore and this week we've had like two or three different little snowstorms. Yeah, it's been snowing. And it's been, I'm really hoping that it doesn't affect the flights, but it should be it good. It shouldn't. So. I mean, it really, it it shouldn't at this point. Like, so I'll have, not... a, I'll have a lot of time in hotel rooms to catch up and watch jiu-jitsu. If you want to uh, ping us about jiu-jitsu, hit us up at, at Grappling Rewind on Instagram. Yep. Always happy to talk to you, uh, to talk, talk to folks about grappling. That's why we do the show. Anything else fun this week? I don't think so. All right. I'm well, probably forgetting about something, but I it's, it's been At this point, show. I don't know. But... As always on the show, I'm your host, Mange, my co-host, Miranda, and we are the Grappling Rewind, and that's what it is. Stay safe.
If you like the show, please consider sharing it on Facebook with the folks at your gym. It's the best way that we grow the show and we really appreciate it. You can reach out to us on email. We also have Instagram. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have Google+. Plus. Until that shuts down. We have a website. If you have an event you would like to have us cover, please let us know. If you have a name, like most people do, and you'd like to have us stop butchering it, let us know. Reach out to us. The show is also available on YouTube, Spotify, in addition to iTunes and every other podcast service. We very much appreciate your time and thank you.